Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, welcome back to another episode of The Keel Show here live on 12 Ounce Sports. If you're watching us live, you're watching us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Zingo TV. Channel 761. Sign up for free today using the promo code 12 ounce. That's 1 2 O Z. Get Z, Z or Z for the proper English users. Whatever. <laughs> Get involved in the show today using hashtag TKS at the Keel Show on Twitter and Facebook. If you have any questions during the live show, hit us up in the chat or in the comments on any of our posts. Otherwise, make sure to hit us up during the week with anything that you're listening to. If you are one of our many, 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 many podcast listeners or if you're watching us on the replay on the Keel Show YouTube page, official. Official, because like we don't have a blue check mark, but... We got we got stuff. It's our official page. Nobody's trying to be us because we are the one and only. Take ass. One and only. Today's show on 12 on Sports is brought to you by none other than mybookie.ag. Bet on all sports, win and get paid. The Super Bowl is coming up. It's Football ca- playoffs. Cleveland. Cleveland, believe land. Dude, Cooper and I were working. <laughs> Cle- believe land. Okay, LeBron James. Dude. That game last night, I the first snap, the first snap of the game, it goes over Big Ben's head. We lost our minds. We we couldn't control ourselves. Isn't he just like gonna retire after the season? Well, there's a lot of talk about it. I'm not sure. He might as well. I just remember just going off because we're like, because I mean we're Michigan fans here, so trouble with the snap, unfortunately, is a phrase that brings back bad memories. So now Pittsburgh fans get it too. Got all this, you know, all this, you know, being all spoiled with Crosby and Malkin, even Big Ben there for a couple of years. Trouble with the snap. It's on you now, Pittsburgh. Even though, like, I, I like Big Ben. I just, I just need someone else to share the pain with. I mean, uh, either way, that was that was a rough. The day. one thing that we need to take away from this is the fact that the Buffalo Bills and the Cleveland Browns know how to bring it back. From being in dire straits to be being in the top teams of the NFL. Detroit Lions, you have your homework. There's your playbook. MyBookie.ag using the promo code 12 ounce sports. Join for free today. Today or tomorrow. I mean, you can say tomorrow. I mean, games are on Saturday. Whenever, Sunday. whenever you're using it. There's also yeah. NBA as well. Today's show is also brought to you by our good friends at Second String Leather Company. Eight. Light the lamp candles are back in stock. And new two-inch drop leather earrings. Yeah, second like string, little danglers. Second String Leather Company. Excuse me. SecondStringLeather.com. Ha- buy Second String Leather Company. Hashtag, hashtag crafted, crafted from, from the, the crease. crease. I think we should be their spokespeople. We should be. We should do their all of their advertising. Jump in, Joe. Just just throw that money at us, big boy. I would have He built enough, a bar for I would six. have no problem with being the marketing person over there. Absolutely no problem. That'd be sick. But if you do not want to invest your time and or money into either of our wonderful partners, which you should because they're wonderful, absolutely phenomenal. Never would have guessed it. Phenomenal, Alex? Phenomenal. phenomenal. But you know what else is phenomenal? Our own merchandise. That, that is right. TKS, the Keel Show official merchandise at teespring.com. That's T-E-E, spring, as in the season, dot com slash stores slash the Keel Show. But dashes in between the and Keel and Show. Yes. I feel like I have to remember Teespring I mean, to dot com that. slash stores slash the Keel Show. Men's and women's and unisex attire for all those who want to support the show. Yes, because, you know, people, they like to wear our stuff. I mean, I like to. I mean, my th- that sweater's comfortable. At the very least, support the show. I think don't don't we have uh, like stickers on there or something? We got, sh- we do have stickers. I did create stickers. I just never got one for myself, which is dumb because I can put on my laptop. My laptop, which is literally an array of advertisements at this point. Precisely free advertising. Well, second string, of course, because that's you know that's not free advertising. But we got the Kewl Quest down there, and then we got you can't see it. There's Howie's over here. Howie's hockey tape and CBS, which I got for which I got for Christmas. Cause which is uh, founders. Founders CBS. Dad got me that for Christmas. Yeah, he got me a tall boy. Oh, nice. A big, like a glass tall boy. Not yeah. this, oh, it's 24 ounce can. No, this thing is a honking bottle of thing. Yeah. He got the one me, that Chewy broke. He got me uh, a Founders Imperial Stout, the ones that they sell at Ooh, Meyer. Those are good. So I have to crack that bad boy open at some time. 
On today's program, we have the college hockey scoreboard with none other than our college hockey insider, Tyler Keel. We have Stephen Ellis from the Hockey News joining us to wrap up the World Juniors. We have an NHL season preview, which will be involving our guest, who's going to be talking about the Winnipeg Jets hockey, Ken Weeb. But before we get to him, shall we, Tyler, talk about... The rest of Scotia North. Scotia North. Do we want... Okay, so that kind of all came about, Alex, right after the... Kind of the last week's show where they the NHL sold the rights to the divisions. Right, which I, I think was, I, a, was, a, it was a good I get opportunity it. for them. I get it. That's the thing, though. It's not like, oh, my gosh, they're, they're selling the game. They're spending all this money. I get it. For this year... For everything that has gone on from helmets and literally, I mean, like, let's just be honest. Let's be glad that the ads on the ice are not going to look like a minor league ice. I mean, they're starting to get there, but like there, there's going to be a lot of ads on the ice. This is the year that you're just going to go overboard with commercials. But Alex, we'll have to go on to the more of the division next because, because Alex, we have on our show, helping us to take a look at the Winnipeg Jets is the man who covers the team for Sportsnet, making his second appearance on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it is none other than Ken Weeb. Hey, Ken, how's it going? Hey, it's going excellent. Uh, thanks for your patience there. Uh, living in our COVID society, I thought it would be an easy in and out at the grocery store, but... Uh, Got caught up uh, quickly. Sorry about that. Oh, oh no problem good. at all. Yeah. No problem. That's uh, that's that's probably a good way to start it off, Ken, because we've had guests from Alberta, Ontario, and it's it's kind of different all across North America and how people are acting with COVID. How is it going in Manitoba, in your neck of the woods? Well, it's uh, back on the improving list, but uh, it had been a bit of a rough rough patch here after a very good summer uh, the numbers kind of spiked uh, recently in november and december we've been in, in code red lockdown since uh, november 6th basically so limiting yourself to your household basically only i mean there is some interaction outdoors but uh, not a lot of not a lot of conversing so when the training camp opened and the media were allowed to attend uh, you had a lot of uh, happy reporters uh, that's for sure a chance to to see uh, some familiar faces, even though you're, uh, you know, socially distanced and six feet apart, and it's not quite the same as we're used to in an empty building. But uh, any human interaction during a pandemic is is welcome, and, and we've been happy to have some uh, during this week and change. At training camp has been ongoing. Oh yeah, because that that's one thing too. And um, so, you know, talking about sports, then I listened to Elliot Friedman and Jeff Merrick's Thirty One Thoughts podcast, and and Freed said how he he's not a fan of of, oh, look at this guy. This guy scored in the team scrimmage today. He scored two goals in the scrimmage. This goaltender made a big save. Like, he, he used to be annoyed by that, but the fact that it's, you know, back, like, that conversation's across, across social media, it's just kind of like a nice, relaxing feeling that knowing that hockey's back. Kind of take us inside. You know, we, we see what the players have to do, all the COVID testing and some having to quarantine themselves. And I know Vancouver had an issue over the weekend with positive tests. Dallas has to delay the start of their season. From a media side perspective, Ken, what has been the biggest change for you covering the Jets and trying to provide the most in-depth content while maybe not being as close as you are to the team as you've been in the past? Yeah, it's a great question and a great point. I mean, let, let's say first and foremost, we're, we're very fortunate to be able to uh, do the jobs that we do. And even though we've had to adjust to a, to a Zoom society like everyone else, uh, uh, fortunate first and foremost to be covering uh, the National Hockey League and to be in the arenas right now at a time when a lot of people are uh, for lack of a better term, maybe stuck at home, if you will, uh, working uh, working from home. But yeah, I mean, it certainly changed uh, the element. The personal element uh, is not not quite there. Obviously, uh, Zoom is helpful in terms of facilitating interviews. But uh, for someone who is on the beat and following the team on a day to day basis, uh, you'd love the opportunity uh, when that time comes to be in the room and when you can have those kind of casual one on one conversations and. It's not only just about the hockey talks you're able to have, but I mean the Jets have a lot of thoughtful guys on their team, uh, guys like Adam Lowry, uh, Andrew Kopp, guys that like to talk about what books they're reading, and um, you just sort of lose that human element. I mean, everyone is kind of uh, in it. Everyone's in the same situation, but it's just weird. But our cameras are turned off, so the, the players are looking into a blank camera, and it just isn't as personal as what we're used to. And 
uh, it's a little bit tougher to to kind of forge a professional relationship with a with a new player uh, if you're not having any FaceTime interaction. I mean, Trevor Lewis is a guy who's been in camp on a PTO, very professional. Nate Thompson, very professional. But I mean, when a new guy comes in to a team, I mean, you like to introduce yourself, and I mean, who knows what kind of handshakes will be happening after the pandemic? But uh, it's just that's certainly definitely an adjustment. And uh, so when you're looking at everyone basically has equal access to the same individuals. Then you're at, you're looking to add um, outside voices for lack of a better term. I did an in-depth feature on Paul Stassi recently. Yeah. I was fortunate to connect with a bunch of his former teammates and coaches. Uh, so you have to go, I mean, it's great to be able to have uh, access periods where you get zoom calls, but if you're looking for, um, you know, creative content and original content, uh, you need to tap into some of those, former voices, whether they be American Hockey League teammates or junior Hockey League teammates and, and coaches. So it, it, it creates a, you know, a bit of a challenge for reporters as well as the players and coaches. Yeah, that's a very good point, especially when we get guests on our show, especially like yourself where you cover the team. It's always nice to see, sometimes hear the stories that we don't usually hear from other aspects or other rooms of the league. So having that kind of inside scoop in those different stories that you guys um, have for your specific teams, a specific you for the Jets with Sportsnet. That's definitely something that uh, we like to have on our show, uh, which is unfortunate when, when you're trying to build that relationship and it's kind of ha- has those barriers like you mentioned. But talking about the offseason and the new players that are coming in, um, overall, how do you think that Shevel Dayoff has done with the Jets organization, bringing in some, some key talent and then going through some trials and tribulations. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it was an interesting off season for sure. I mean, I think the beauty of having so much time between games, first with the March pause and with the you know August return, and on a team like the Jets and, and so many other teams that were out after the qualifying round uh, in such a short span. I mean, you have a fan base that's yearning for moves, and you want blockbusters, and you know, there's always a chance that the Jets could have been one of those teams that that blew the field away and, and landed a guy like Alex Petrangelo, the big fish. But I mean, we know it's, it's, it's a challenge for the Winnipeg marketplace to lure those top, top end, top tier free agents. So uh, Kevin Chevaldeoff went to plan B and, and brought, brought in a very capable veteran in Paul Stastny, who has some familiarity, who enjoyed being here and a guy who had some chemistry with the Patrick Liney and Nikolai Ehlers uh, during his short time with the Jets uh, back in 2018 when he, came over at the deadline and waived his no movement clause so I think that's obviously a very important move on a number of levels Paul's incredibly smart he can still play he's very productive uh the one thing I would say that even though I'm fans will say oh well his numbers in Vegas weren't great well he's playing with a different level of finishing talent with the Jets uh playing with Patrick Laine uh, is a little bit different than when you know again Max Pacioretty had a great year and poured in a lot of goals uh often playing with Stastny but in terms of the natural pure finishing ability i think the jets have a couple more elite talents when it comes to that and again that's not a knock mark stone is a guy from winnipeg big fan of his game big fan of him being in the sulky consideration and being a 20 to 30 goal guy but uh, the jets have some explosive goal scorers and kyle connor nikolai ehlers patrick lane who i think will help uh, give paul stassi's numbers a boost just like they did last time when he showed up and was a, a almost a point of game player, I believe 17 points in 19 playoff games as the Jets made it to the conference finals. So uh, he's sort of that uh, connector uh, for a very, you know, he has a great relationship with Blake Wheeler. They played together over in Germany uh, during the lockout season. They have spent some time together uh, in the US, USA hockey program. Right. But he also has a great relationship with Mark Shifley. So he provides a really good one, two punch down the middle. Uh, he's a really studious guy. loves to talk hockey, just like Shifley. So, I think he'll have a big impact on and off the ice. And then on the back end, it was a matter of not not the big-time uh, headline-grabbing moves, but uh, retaining a Dylan DeMello, who really helped stabilize the back end, and then going out and getting a guy like Derek Forbert, a former first-round pick who was with the LA Kings, and then most recently with the Calgary Flames. Uh, he brings uh, a little bit of bite on the back end and some size for, uh, for a defense core that uh, was a little bit on the smaller side after losing guys like Dustin Bufflin, Tyler Myers, and Jacob Truba, and Ben Sherratt the year prior. Yeah, that, that, that blue line, you know, we kind of talked about a little bit going into the playoffs last year, and I think I may have talked a, bit, a little bit about with you, Ken, when we had you on in the summer, 
back in our in our basic podcast days. But you know, they're one of the guys that I've kind of kind of grown fond of just because the way he style of his play is 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 Jack Roslovic. But what's this update on the situation with that? He came yeah. into camp without a contract. What's the update with Roslovic? Is he staying? He's because he's an RFA, so it's not like he can just go somewhere else freely. There's got to be a move made by both the Jets and the obviously the team I would want him. What's the update on that situation? Yeah, great question. Uh, Claude Lemieux uh, hasn't been hasn't been releasing a whole lot of information on that. What we know is uh, Claude Lemieux being a nice guy. Who would have thought? <laughs> oh no, Claude Claude's a nice guy. He just uh, the Jets uh, prefer to keep those things out of the uh, media, as frustrating as it can be for us. But uh, what we know is that Jack Rosovic remains in Columbus. At least that was the last update. Uh, we don't expect him in Winnipeg before. Uh, he signs a contract, and uh, that would mean he will not be uh, in the lineup for the opener and for the foreseeable future. He'll have a seven-day quarantine uh, to complete along with four uh, negative COVID tests before he would be an option to get into the lineup. Um, it's possible that he's traded, sure, but, I mean, if the Jets had been blown away by an offer in the summertime, uh, I think Jack Rosovic would have already been moved. So. Uh, it's a bit of a game of chicken, if you will, a bit of a standoff. Uh, I think the Jets have a number that they're comfortable with. I think it would be very uh, similar to what Jordan Greenway would have got from the Minnesota Wild on a two-year deal. It's somewhere in that neighborhood of uh, $2 million. Uh, so, I mean, uh, somewhere between 1.5 and two year. I mean, Jack Roswick's coming off a career year, 12 goals, 29 points. Uh, he has great offensive upside. I've said it before. I think he can be a 20-goal scorer. At the NHL level, a 45 to 55 point guy uh, in the right situation. But uh, on the flip side, uh, it's about role and fit. And I mean, Jack Rosovic uh, hasn't been overly thrilled with with the potential of being a, a third line player, even though that third line is counted on for the Jets uh, with Adam Lowry and Andrew Kopp. Although they're a checking line, they spend a lot of time in the offensive zone. So Jack Rosovic would be a guy who's you know he's got great goal scoring ability. I think he's a good fit on that line, but right now you have a situation where the guy currently on the job, Mason Appleton, uh, Michigan State uh, product, uh, he'd be thrilled with having that job, uh, whereas Roslovic uh, so far hasn't been really happy with playing that third-line checking role, even though he does get some second power play time. So there's a risk for Roslovic. Obviously, uh, he's standing up for what he believes in and what he wants, but um, he also runs the risk of, of being passed on the depth chart. I mean, I'm not saying that Jack Roswick will be a fourth line player uh, if he signs with the Jets, uh, as what we would expect that to happen. But um, the longer a guy like Mason Appleton is given the opportunity to take the job, I mean, those two guys uh, both put up great numbers with the Manitoba Moose. Mason Appleton had 22 goals and 66 points as a rookie pro. So uh, there is some risk involved with uh, with having a contract impasse and. If someone passes you on the depth chart, it makes it that much tougher to get your job back. Having said that, I mean, Rostovic is still in the Jets' plans, and I expect him to be a you know, a, a contributor uh, once this gets sorted out. And I would say it's more likely he signs. But, I mean, the clock's ticking. He has until February 11th. And, I mean, in, in a normal year, could you go over to Europe and try to force the, the team's hand? Sure. But, I mean, the historical playbook would suggest that uh, even though you ask for a trade, doesn't mean you're going to be moved. And I mean, you can ask Jacob Truba and Evander Kane, and oh, yeah. uh, to a degree Patrick Liney, uh, how that w- the Jets will not be backed into a corner and, and simply relent if a player uh, asks for a trade and if they do not get what they consider to be fair value. Hmm. That's a very good answer. I I really like that one. I, uh, I will say I love Mason Appleton though. I used to call him Johnny Appleseed back yeah, in the day. Yeah, that's true. Party back in the day. <laughs> that is true. But a player on the roster who is not probably going to be leaving the Jets organization anytime soon is none other than goaltender Connor Hellebuck. Uh, save percentage last year of .922. He, had, he was awarded the most shutouts in the NHL with six out of his 31 wins. This is a, a player that was the first-team All-Star. Um, do you think that he's going to have another Vesna caliber season this coming year? I mean, I really do. I mean, two of the last three years, uh, Hellebuck has put up uh, uh, Vesna-type performances. He's been up for the award two of the last three years. And uh, in the middle, I would say it had more to do with the fact that, uh, like a lot of goaltenders who, you know, become a first, you know, full-time guy and sign a big ticket, uh, there's a little bit of a tendency to try to earn that uh, 
earn that money in that first year. Uh, I mean, the Jets gave up the most high danger chances last year, uh, yet that didn't prevent Hellebuck from putting up stellar numbers. Uh, obviously, the focus of training camp has been on being a better defensive team. Uh, can the Jets do that when the games start? I mean, that remains to be seen, but I would expect them to be uh, putting Hellebuck in a, a little bit better position, A, and B, I would expect Hellebuck to continue to push himself uh, because, as we know, uh, you know, he wanted to win a Vesna. He wants to win multiple Vesnas, but uh, his 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 uh, focus and goals are more related to that uh, larger silver trophy that is awarded to the teams. Uh, so I would, ex- I mean, he's a very driven individual. And the other part about it too, I mean, Hellebuck has been outstanding, but uh, in the lot, the playoff success uh, has not been there the last two trips to the playoffs. That's not a knock on Connor Hellebuck. It's not laying any blame whatsoever his way. Uh, but since that run to the to the play or to the conference final uh, against Vegas, uh, I mean he was the second best goalie in the series against the Flames, and that I mean again that's not a knock on him. That means Cam Talbot was able to elevate, but uh, Connor Hellebuck is very driven and motivated, and uh, he wants to be the number one goalie and the best goalie in all future series that he plays in. So uh, I expect he's put in the work. Uh, I know that even in terms of his mentality. Uh, just him saying that he would, you know, he's okay with 40 to 45 starts. That to me is a step in the right direction. In the past, he would have said, I'm good for all 56 guys. Let's go. But I think he knows that the Jets are going to need Lauren Brassois to play somewhere in that neighborhood of, you know, 12 to 14 games in order to keep Hellebuck fresh in a compressed schedule so that he can be at his peak and playing at an optimal level uh, once the playoffs begin, should the Jets qualify. Yeah. And that's, that's the one big thing too. I mean, cause Hellebuck, I, I look at the the qualifying round last year, Ken, against Calgary, and I, just, I think Hellebuck was arguably their best player in Winnipeg. I mean, yeah, there was the Kachuk, you know, saga. Of course, then again, Matthew Kachuk against any team seems to be <laughs> has some issues out there in the West. But, I mean, you need to have a goaltender fresh. And now in Toronto, there's a similar problem with Frederick Anderson and now Jack Campbell being the 1B goaltender. How is Sheldon Keefe going to do that? I mean, how important is it that Laurent Brassois, who was a great goaltender coming out of the WHL, how important is he going to be to step up and fill those games? You know, because like you said, Hellebuck needs to be fresh come the playoffs if the Jets are able to qualify. But like I said, they're going to have to be able to qualify. So that puts maybe even more pressure on Laurent Brassois to be at not just, you know, a good backup role, but almost a 1B role to help out Hellebuck and help the Jets do well when Hellebuck's not in net. Yeah, certainly. I mean, Lauren Brassois is highly motivated as well. I mean, he's a guy who uh, is determined to become a starter in the National Hockey League. I mean, that is almost impossible to do when you're playing behind a Vezina Trophy winner. Uh, but two years ago, Lauren Brassois provided the type of backup goaltending uh, that was required. I mean, he was excellent for the Jets for the majority of the year uh, before he got hurt in a game in March uh, in Vegas where he, where he hurt his groin. But um, last year was a bit of a step back for him. And I mean, the sample size still at the NHL level is relatively small. Uh, he has something to prove. He is a, also a very diligent worker and a guy that's very motivated to push. I mean, he talked about wanting to get upwards of 20 starts. I, I don't think that number will be that high, uh, barring an injury to Connor Hellebuck, but he's not just happy playing 10 games and being the backup, uh, you know, football mentality, the guy who's holding the clipboard. He is pushing himself to be better. He wants to improve to that level he was at two years ago and maybe even take a further step and, you know, going into a UFA year to maybe show some teams that he has what it takes to be put in a, you know, 1A and 1B situation uh, instead of here in Winnipeg where he's going to be the clear-cut number two guy. Yeah, that's really important to have a good backup and a motivated backup like Bersois. And, you know, kind of going backwards here, Ken, we talked about Roswick, but we also talked about, you mentioned Patrick Lyonet and that trade saga. And I remember when I reached out to you to come back on this show, Ken, you mentioned, cause I mentioned the word slump with Patrick line and you were, and you corrected yeah. me and deservedly. So he was on pace for 35 goals last year, which is an upward direction of a player like Patrick line, a guy that you want to ha- have to be that big time score with that shot and the offensive prowess. However, going into these, this season, there's been the big question, will he stay or will he go? And now I don't mean to quote the clash all the time, but you know, uh, how important is it that Line wants to be in Winnipeg? Do you, th- do you, are you getting that feeling from Patrick Line? And I mean, obviously you would think the Jets would like him there because of his offensive ability, but is the future long-term with Patrick Line and the Winnipeg Jets? 
Yeah, that's a great question for sure. And again, I wasn't trying to be negative when I was correcting you. But oh no, Ken, you're it good. Just you're good. To show, it, it just goes to show the the high standard that he set for himself. I mean, in Patrick Laine's worst full season, he had 30 goals. But the problem with that is that he had 18 of them in one month. Yeah. So, you know, when it's only 12 over the rest of the year, it was natural to say, well, yeah, we went from 44 to 30 and now to 28. But uh, I mean, for me, Patrick Laine only had the biggest difference in Laine's goal total last year was that he only had eight on the power play where he was used to getting double digits, 15 to 20. So they need to get back to using that as their primary weapon on the power play. Uh, teams did a good job of taking that away from them. Uh, but when it, come, when it comes to the long-term discussion, I mean, uh, the players are rarely forthcoming when it comes to requests. I mean, we know uh, it was a bit of an uncomfortable interview for Patrick Liney. He was a very gregarious person, happy-go-lucky. Uh, he was, you know, under the microscope in his first appearance last Monday. Uh, I think he still did say the majority of the right things. Did he come out and deny that he asked for a trade? Absolutely not. So, I think he was given every opportunity to do so. And I know that uh, some fans were saying, well, weren't the media listening? Liney, Liney said he wants to be here. Well, that's true. But he, he was always sort of dancing around the question of, you know, did you ask for the trade? Was it your only your agents? He was given every opportunity to say, hey, I've rescinded the trade request and I'm good to go. But, I mean, the important part about what he did say and what I believe to be true, having covered him for the first you know, now this will be his fifth year of his career since he was drafted. Liney will not be a distract, distraction for this team. He will not be jumping on a, pul- a pulpit and saying, I want out of here, this is ridiculous. Uh, he will be solely focused on taking that next step in his development. Uh, you know, he answered my question about the, what the next step looks like by saying, I can be better defensively, I can score more, uh, all of those things. So for me, having Paul Stastny back will help. Uh, alleviate some of the concerns for Patrick Laine, who, again, he wants to be a frontline player. I mean, the difference between playing with Paul, you know, Paul Stassi and Mark Shifley, the minutes between those first and second lines are not that, you know, there's not a huge variation. And the, the fact that Stassi is so reliable can actually help Laine uh, when it comes to his matchups and things of that nature. So I don't think there's a concern in season about how A, Laine will perform or B, uh, if a trade will be made, because I've said all along, again, this can change with one phone call, but given the quarantine rules, um, I just don't see Line A being on the move this year until the off season, uh, unless things fall uh, to a very uh, negative direction for the Jets, and then some team uh, makes a ridiculous offer for a playoff push this year. For me, Line A will be with the Jets this season. Uh, can some fences be mended during the course of the next five months? Boy, a lot has changed in the last five months, and I, I wouldn't rule him out long term, but uh, it is complicated, and it's also complicated for a team that wants to trade for him because of a flat cap situation. And what it, the cost of acquisition plus the cost it's going to take to ink line A to a seven-year deal, uh, that makes it difficult. So, I mean, the Jets still have team control for a couple more years, but I would expect that a move, if it's going to happen, would come uh, in the off season or the following one. But... I think that he's going to be locked in with the Jets, and I expect him to deliver the best season as a pro. Again, that doesn't necessarily mean 44 goals in a truncated season, but uh, what we've seen from Lenny, he's skating well. He's uh, really scoring a lot in the, you know, in the sessions that we've seen. He's a highly motivated individual, and he knows the best way for him to cash in, both in terms of contract and in terms of boosting his trade value, is to have an outstanding season, and I expect him to have one. Yeah, I was able to do a once-over of that interview a couple times through different outlets, and I was able to watch that presser. And I think the, it just goes to show you what kind of professional that line A is. He understands that you know this is a, a long-term kind of game when it comes about talking contracts and talking about you know signing the dotted line, if you will. So I, I don't think anyone has the concern that he's going to be playing poorly. Like you mentioned, you know he's going to be having – a phenomenal season to the best of his ability. He's ready there. He's ready to play. Um, regardless of what jersey he's going to wear, he wants to have a good showing. That way he can earn the dollars that he thinks that he deserves and the years that he thinks that he deserves. 
I mean, there's always the rumors that are going around. I mean, I, I heard one earlier this week that he's possibly going to go to to Carolina, which is my personal favorite team, which I would be completely okay <laughs> uh, with. Of course like, you'd be. But like you mentioned, it's going to be one of those things that with this flat cap this year, it's going to be very hard for teams to be able to pick up a talent like Patrick Laine for how for how much he's worth and being able to extend that contract, which I'm I'm sure that if a team like Carolina were to get a talent like Patrick Laine, they would probably want to do so. So there, I don't think there's any concern about his performance, like you said. But talking about performance, who do you think on the squad that is in the lineup, quote unquote, right now, who do you think needs to have a better season? to push Winnipeg over this little hump that they have to get them, you know, into the playoffs and then further in. Yeah, for sure. Uh, just one last thing. Uh, obviously we know we've also heard the Pierre Luc Dubois rumors and I mean, oh, yeah. let's just play the game and connect the dots. I mean, you've got two star young star players who are looking for a change of scenery. Boy, oh boy. Uh, you know, never find the fact that the uh, blue jackets GM is fin is finished and certainly would have interest, uh, I mean, I do think that there are, you know, that would be a potential deal, not necessarily one for one, because obviously, you know, Columbus would be looking at a, you know, center premium position, whereas the Jets would counter by saying, well, Lionel's seventh in goal since he entered the league. Uh, I mean, could there be some other parts that make make that deal come together at some point? Certainly, but as you mentioned, I mean, Sebastian, Sebastian Ajo and Patrick Laine have some pretty good history together as gold medal winners as well at the World Juniors. So it'll be fun to watch how that develops, but. Uh, in terms of this year, I mean, I think Nikolai Ehlers has another level to reach. I mean, that wouldn't be, a, you know, it wouldn't be a stretch. Uh, in terms of the under-the-radar guys, I think look to the back end. I mean, uh, Tucker Pullman, a guy who played at UND, uh, he's 27 years old. Uh, not a young guy, but he was young in terms of NHL experience. Uh, looks like he'll get the first crack uh, on the top pairing with Josh Morrissey. I mean, I think Dylan DeMello will eventually get into that role. Uh, when it comes to more of the flashier side of things, and it will take some time but Billy Hainel had just an outstanding uh, showing at the World Junior Hockey Championship for yeah. Finland. Um, I think that if he can force his way into this lineup on the back end, uh, boy, oh boy, he'll be fun to watch. He has that offensive flair that the Jets don't have an abundance of on the back end. And, uh, I mean, for me, we know Paul Maurice uh, favors his veterans, but I think that if he's given an opportunity, Hainel may give the Jets no no other choice but to give him a chance and a longer look. But, uh, again, as someone to cover the American League, I can see the benefit by having both he and Dylan Sandberg, who, again, another top defenseman prospect, not as flashy and not as offensive, but he also brings that size and skating ability quality that the Jets don't have a lot of or, or have a little bit of a shortage of on the back end. Uh, both those both those guys could see time with the Moose, but Hanela is a guy who could give you that uh, flash and dash if he's given an opportunity, but it may take an injury uh, or a compressed schedule for him to get that chance. The problem for him, just guys, that he had that seven, eight day quarantine uh, after the World Junior. I mean, in normal situation, you're feeling so good coming out of a, you know, medal winning performance, but now he's had to, you know, basically sit in a hotel room and ride the bike and try to stay fresh mentally. Uh, so he's going to start in the taxi squad. Paul Maurice told us today, but uh, I look for him to force his way into the, into the conversation sooner than later. Uh, but I mean, again, I would I would caution for those uh, folks thinking that he's going to be on that Calder ballot. Uh, just I just don't think the opportunity is there at the beginning. But this is a player who's a high end talent, and I think forces his way into the discussion sooner than later. Yeah, it's it's looking like the preseason talk, of course, like with most drafts, there everyone's looking at the Calder as the the top three picks right now between Byfield, Stutzla, and of course Lafreniere in New York. But, I mean, do you think, before my last question here, Kent, before my last question, I know Alex has another one here, but do you think it would be better, because with the American Hockey League here starting in a month now, we could start here in Grand Rapids as well in February, do you think it would be better if, if a player like Vili would go down and just get those reps in, get those game reps in with the Moose, or do you think it would be better for him to be around the NHL team to watch how the guys train and practice with the team and get a feel for what it's like being in the NHL. Do you think that would be better than staying at the AHL? Do you think being on the taxi squad would actually be more beneficial? Yeah. I mean, just the reason why I say he's going to start in the taxi squad, there's really no other choice. Like until American league camps get going, there's really no other place for him to be. And if there's no That's game true, match yeah. until February 4th or 5th, you know, provided the AHL stays on schedule, which we hope that they do, I think that's why, I mean, again, 
will the Jets stash Hanel on the on the taxi squad for three months? No, not a chance. But uh, it's the best place for him right now. Uh, for me, having covered the American League, I, I think it's better for Hanel to be playing 20 to 25 minutes a game at that level if he's only being used at a you know eight to 12 minute range at the NHL level. Uh, at least, and that's when he forces his way into the lineup. I mean, uh, the benefit of playing top four minutes that uh, we've seen from so many players who have graduated from the American League Hockey League level. Uh, so for me, I, I think at the beginning, playing 2020 plus and then forcing your way into the discussion is a better, uh, you know, better long term outlet. Having said that, you know, if there's either a you know sickness or injury option that happens in those first two weeks, Hanel may never reach the American League. And the difference for him too, guys, he's played in Liga for several years. It's not like the normal guy coming out of junior where he has to go get a taste of the pro game. Yes, of course it's different, but at least he has pro experience, which would allow him to stay ready on a taxi squad. But big picture, he needs to play games. And if that means he's not in the top six for the Jets, go down and play your 2025 in the American League. And then when you're ready, play big time minutes. Uh, when you're ready to play in the NHL rather than, than be in that, uh, you know, bag skate situation and scenario where you're practicing with a group of six players for the majority of the time, that that's not going to be a true benefit. Yeah. Black, being a part of the black aces, it's, it's a good, you know, hardworking group, a very proud group, but it, it doesn't mean you're going to be successful, unfortunately right. from being, from being in that myself a little bit, but now the heavy duty question here, Ken, the North division, the, okay. Sco- the Scotia North division, by the way, paid a lot of money for that. They did. I think, I don't know. The way the NHL described it, it was the biggest, you know, sell except, you know, maybe the Rogers TV rights, but uh, you know, everyone's talking Toronto and maybe Edmonton to be the top two in this division, even though I think it's going to be a lot more competitive this year than if you say the beginning of last season with Ottawa's going to be a little bit tougher. Montreal may be interesting. Vancouver will be fun to watch the battle of Alberta seven times this year is just going to leave a bloodbath over in that province. But right there is Winnipeg, right in the middle of all of it. Where do you think Winnipeg will end up? Do they have, I mean, can, I mean, like I said, only four teams allowed in each division still, just like the years past, except for last year, of course. But in the normal year, only four teams from each division. Can the Jets crack a spot there with so much depth and so much talent in this North division? Can they get into the playoffs? And if so, can they progress? Or, you know, are they going to be a team that's going to have to maybe look to next year? Yeah, for me, I think the Jets can certainly be a playoff team again. Are they a lock, lead pipe lock? Absolutely not. But uh, for me, because I think people undervalue how good their top six is uh, in terms of high-end talent. We know a lot of teams have great talent. Leafs, sure, as you mentioned, with McDavid and Dreisaitl, the Oilers have incredible high-end talent. But for me, I think the Jets' high-end talent has a lot of playoff experience. You know, They have some playoff experience, the benefit of that. Uh, and I think that when you have the Vezina winning goaltender, uh, it just gives you a bit of a bump, especially in a shortened season. I mean, do the Jets have some question marks on the back end? Absolutely. But if Derek Torbert can handle top four minutes with Neil Pionk, and eventually if, Vinny Hale, if Billy Hanel pushes his way into the discussion, and once Sandberg arrives, I mean, now the position of you know perceived weakness could be a strength quickly. Uh, so for me, I do see the Jets as a playoff team. They could finish anywhere from second to sixth, and I think no one would be surprised. But I think that this is one of those years where after two early exits, uh, you have a a team that went to the conference final two seasons ago, highly motivated. They're still in in their window to win, if you will. Uh, You know, guys like Mark Scheifele, I think, are going to flourish going head-to-head with Austin Matthews and Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid and company. And and I think their back end is going to perform a little bit better than some people think. And if they get those improvements on the power play, which was, you know, top five, top 10 unit, uh, the two years prior to last year, I think that can really be a, an effective weapon for them uh, when it comes to, you know, being a playoff team and just inching out one of those teams. Uh, I mean, for me, uh, my, you know, bold prediction, if you will, and I probably will live to regret it, but I think the Oilers concerns in the, in between the pipes with Koskinen and Smith, uh, coupled with losing Oscar Clefbaum, I think that the Oilers are going to be uh, one of the teams that are on the outside looking in, whereas I know a lot of people have them winning the division. Uh, and for me also, Toronto, it's a make-or-break year for their core four forwards. Uh, if they can't advance past the first round of the playoffs for the first time since 2004, uh, one of them will have to be moved. 
and some changes will be coming. I think the Leafs have improved their back end, but I mean, as you mentioned, how, how many games is Freddie Anderson going to play and and how does Jack Campbell handle that backup role? Uh, for me, I actually have Calgary uh, taking the division and the fourth spot, uh, third spot is between Montreal and Vancouver. And I, I have Montreal right now, though I could easily see them slipping out. You know, the team that wins the off season doesn't always perform best uh, as many uh, San Diego Padres fans would know prior to this season where they finally had their breakthrough. So uh, it's going to be fascinating to watch. Uh, I can't wait to see how it all unfolds. And uh, we're so fortunate to you know, have the season starting uh, for everyone or so for the NHL Wednesday and for the Jets on Thursday. It's going to be dynamite. And I hope you guys enjoy it as well. I will say this. I'm only clipping this right now. So when it comes back to haunt Ken, I'll make sure it's saved and posted everywhere on social <laughs> media. <laughs> Yeah. Now hey, I'm, I'm an accountable guy. I'm an accountable guy, guys. I'm happy to come back on and you can, you can throw it right back in my face. Uh, bring out when, when I'm wrong, bring out for 30 seconds. Can you are wrong? Click. And that's the end. Fair of it. enough. Fair enough. Now, Ken, before just one last question, before we let you go. Um, now this organization is entering its 10th season with the return of Winnipeg Jets hockey, even though the entire world of hockey has known the Jets name since the early seventies. During these past 10 seasons, well, nine seasons plus what could possibly, what is now going to be another 10, what is the best moment that you've had with this current Winnipeg Jets? Yeah, I know. I got obviously the uh, couple quick ones stand out. I mean, the, it will sound crazy, but the first preseason game, the electricity in the building, uh, people were there. It was, you know, first time in 15 years there was an NHL game being played. Uh, the stands were full for the warm-up. People were standing. It was a standing ovation before the game even started. That was outstanding. Uh, and then the opener with the Montreal Canadiens was very similar in terms of uh, just that outpouring of uh, emotion for uh, for a city that had lost and a province that had lost its team uh, to the Phoenix Coyotes. Uh, the other moment that kind of is under the radar, guys, Timu Solani's first game back uh, as a member of the Anaheim Ducks was one of the strangest things I've ever seen. Every time he touched the puck, fans cheered. But when any other member of the Ducks had it, they booed. It was one of the strangest things, if you go back and, and watch the clips from it, uh, that I've ever seen. And then to see what it meant to Solani uh, to have that kind of reception. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, the finish flash was, was beloved here, even though his, his time was short in Winnipeg. Uh, and to see him embrace it, you know, he embraced his kids. Uh, it just happened, to, again, this is what we talk about now, when you had that human interaction on the way to the dressing room, you, you were able to catch that moment where Solani is hugging his sons who were at the game in Jets jerseys when he was playing for Anaheim. That was unbelievable. But I mean, in terms of, you know, the moments that stand out, it's that 2018 playoff run, uh, whether it was the first, first playoff series win uh, for that group uh, against Minnesota or winning a game seven against Nashville. And then the, the electricity in the building, in the Western Conference Final, even though it did not go the way that they had hoped. But when Dustin Bufflin scored uh, on that first shift against Marc-Andre Fleury uh, and a capacity whiteout crowd went absolutely bonkers, uh, that, that to me was probably the moment that will stand out the most in terms of what it meant to the city. Now, again, they lost the next four games, but the emotion in that building and seeing the outdoor parties and all those things in Winnipeg break out, uh, those are the things that you'll miss during this season where as, as happy as we are that it's going to be played, uh, the fact that there are no fans and, and the viewing experience will be different uh, for everyone. I think those are the things that you're going to miss miss out on. But uh, I would say that the, the best Jets moment is probably still yet to come, guys. Ooh, uh, that's another clip right there, Alex. There you go. Prediction. Weebs, it's going to be on Weebs World. It's going to be this awesome, like, you know, Wayne's World. Huh. Doodly-doo, doodly-doo, and then it's going to go to when he predicted the best moment to happen. I still I still watched that the first game back in 2011 against Montreal. I watched the intro because of that crowd. But the Timu Solani one, you, I remember that because there was so much anticipation, even though the Ducks at that time were still good and the Jets were still trying to get up to that point of being a competitive team after their move to Atlanta. But it was such a big deal because – you know, 76 goals. Everyone remembers that and how good he was and how that team in the nineties was right there on the edge. Unfortunately, just they got good. And then they unfortunately had to go down to Phoenix, but the, the fan base in Winnipeg, Ken, it's, 
you know, I, I'd like to think, oh, yeah, Leafs, yeah, the Leafs Nation's big, and you go to Vancouver and there's Leafs fans, and wherever you go, there's Leafs fans. But in the arena at MTS Bell Place, it is this electric college atmosphere. It's the best thing I can compare it to being stateside is just how loud it is and how passionate those fans are, whether it be game four, game 82, game seven in the playoffs. They're there, and they're loud. It's it's the – and I, I want – fans to be back so and the border is open back up so eventually we can go to a game like that so we can experience it for ourselves because on the outside it looks like one of the coolest things ever yeah no doubt i mean especially in a playoff uh, playoff vibe so and that's the beauty of this year i mean uh, for us here across the border is that you know you mentioned it. i mean the, the leafs travel well the canadians travel well and, and when those teams come through uh bell mts place there are a lot of red and blue jerseys for sure but uh, that playoff experience is something that every hockey pa- hockey fan should experience. And uh, when those borders get opened up, we'll be happy to have you guys over uh, whenever that's possible and, and you can experience it for yourselves. It, it is really a special thing. And as I mentioned, I mean, it's part of the beauty of hockey. I mean, there was something similar when, when Grand Rapids and the Moose played, uh, you know, during the lockout year. But, I mean, it's, at the NHL level, it's just, it's just a real special treat. And you know, it's a very intimate building with it only being 15,000. Uh, compared to some of the other uh, bigger buildings like you see in, you know, in Montreal and Chicago uh, as well. So uh, again, we're, we're, we'll adjust to a fan free building, but uh, we'll, we'll enjoy the season nonetheless. And always fun to talk hockey with you guys. It'll definitely be a fun season when it starts Wednesday night, Jets start on Thursday, follow Ken at Weebs world on the Twitter. He's posting stuff all the time. Great content. Like I said, he's got that great article recently about Paul Stasny. He'll be posting stuff throughout the season. Follow him there on Sportsnet, sportsnet.ca. Ken, once again, second time here on the show, almost as good as the first, maybe not, maybe even better. Folks at home can tell us how good this one was. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ken. You enjoy the rest of your night and have a good season, man. My pleasure, guys. Have a great show and have a great season. We'll talk to you again. All right. Thank you. That was Ken Weeb. You know, he was, I think, well, okay. I don't say he was the first guy from Sportsnet, but because technically, well, we had Steve Dangle on before. Actually, no, the Steve Dangle podcast was on Sportsnet. Sort of when we when we talked to him, was it on Sportsnet? It was well, it the was the podcast. Like, the podcast was part of it because Steve was writing for them, and they were like a eleven o'clock hour when they did their shows. So technically, that was Sportsnet. But like Ken was like so when I remember because when I talked to him, it was in the middle of the pandemic. There was still no plan to the playoffs. There was just this lull period. I'm just like, we gotta start bringing some guests on. I know you weren't there for that one, unfortunately, but that was. No, just getting. And remember, like, we talked. I think we, him and I, probably talked for about twenty minutes before the show, just like because I told him I'm from Grand Rapids and the show's in Grand Rapids here, and he's like, "Oh yeah," because you know, because he covered the AHL for so long. He's like, oh, "I remember going down there all the time, and they come up here, and whatever, and you know, Kaiser and stuff like that." We're having these conversations. I'm like, and it, it, I had the same kind of epiphany with um, when I talked with um, with Todd Crocker, the play by play voice of the Marlies. What makes Grand Rapids so special to people? I don't get it. We're awesome. I, I Pe- people don't. I've re- been on this earth for twenty, Honestly. almost twenty six years, and I'm like, Grand Rapids is cool. I guess. Grand. Here's the, here's the thing that people don't realize. Everyone from here, we're like, yeah, we're pretty cool. We're a nice place to be. It's it's fun. We have a, we got a lot of stuff to do, but I honestly believe that. Grand Rapids has to be one of the best places in the United States to visit without knowing that you have to visit there. Without knowing got, you have to visit there. There's so much to do, So such a great atmosphere here, even with all whatever negatives you want to put against Grand Rapids. It's it's a phenomenal place, and you never would have guessed it's it. It's a what, Alex? It's a phenomenal place, and you it's never would have guessed what, it. It's a what, Alex? I said it's a phenomenal place, and you never would have guessed it. I know, but no. So we'll uh, we'll get to the rest of the North Division later because we got only got a few minutes here. We got Stephen Ellis from the Hockey News coming on. So Alex, I think you know what I think we should do, Alex. I think we should uh, let's let's uh, let's turn up the drum line a little bit. Let's prop that drum line a little bit. Sure. Crank up that drum line a little bit because it's time for the College Hockey Scoreboard presented by Second String Leather Company, secondstringleather.com, hashtag crafted from the crease. Let's dive all the way back to Wednesday of last week, guys. AIC beating Army 6-3. Zach Alambos and Justin Cole each had two goals in that game. Sacred Heart beating Air Force 4-3 in overtime. Four players with two points in that game for the Pioneers. Braden Tuck, the game-winning goal 
for the Sacred Heart Pioneers. Hockey East action, UMass beating UNH for nothing. Matthew Kessel, two goals. Zach Jones, three apples in that game. On to Thursday, AIC winning back-to-back -back games against Army 4-3 in overtime. AIC actually trailed 3-1 to one heading to the final two minutes of that game out. Army almost had him beat there. Then Aaron Grounds and Justin Cole tied the game. Blake Bennett, the overtime winner. Number 20, Robert Morris. They are in the top 20 as of right now. Still are as of this week as well. They were able to get a win, 3-2 over Niagara. Brandon McCallion, brother of Justin McCallion of Ferris State, tied the game and then won the game in overtime. ECAC action, St. Lawrence beating Colgate. Emil Zetterquist, by the way, best goaltending pads ever. He's got like the Trevor Kid checkerboard pads. They're pretty sick looking. He made 25 saves in that win for the Saints. St. Lawrence picked up the win. And Eric Dot making 31 saves in Bowling Green's win over Bemidji State. A 3-2 victory there. Now jumping on over to Friday, Atlanta Hockey. Mercy Hurst beating Air Force 5-2. Georgi Fedulov. I think that's Georgi. Okay, how do you think I say that? I think it's Georgi Fedulov. Georgi? That looks like Georgi. There's a very long way of, a very long spelling of it. Jo I, I don't know, man. Georgi, Georgi Fedulov, a goal and two assists. That's a rhetorical question, For sir. the Lakers, 5-2 win. Ohio State beating Penn State 6-3. Austin Pooley, two goals and assists. Tommy Napier. 40 saves for the Buckeyes. Number nine, Michigan putting number nine on the scoreboard. Kent Johnson, a goal and four assists in that game. Strauss, man, second shutout with two assists, Alex. The goaltender getting it on the stat sheet. Look at that. Got to love it. Number 10, Clarkson beating Quinnipiac in over. There were so many overtimes this weekend, Alex. It was ridiculous. Alex, they can't see you. You know that, right? Because the scoreboard's up on the screen. You're pointing over at me in the studio, but no one sees you. Uh, number 10, Clarkson. Zach, T uh, Zach Zako, a goal and assist, including the game-winning goal for the Golden Knights in the win over the Bobcats 5-4 victory. Hockey East action, New Hampshire beating Boston College, upsetting the number two Eagles 4-3 in overtime. Callie Erickson, first ever collegiate goal is the overtime game winner. And also in Hockey East action, Providence beating Boston 7-3 in the Terriers' first game of the year in Vermont, outlasting Maine, picking up their first win by a score of 5-4. NCHC action, number six, St. Cloud State. Showing their good stuff, 4-3. to three. Kevin Fitzgerald, his fourth of the season, being the game-winning goal. Western Michigan beating Miami, 4-1. to one. Alex Eslandis, his first collegiate win in net for the Broncos. WCHA action, Bemidji State beating Bowling Green by a score of 4-3. to three. In overtime, Ethan Somoza with the overtime game-winning goal, his fourth of the season. Alabama Huntsville, 5-4 over the Bulldogs. Four goals were scored in the last seven minutes of this game, Alex, including Ben Allen tying it with 2.4 seconds left for the Chargers. Dane Finneson on the power play in overtime, the game-winning goal. UAH picking up their first win of the year. And Lake Superior State beat Northern Michigan in a battle of two Upper Peninsula teams. That score, 4-1. to one. Now we jump on over to Saturday as we look at Robert Morris beating Niagara again in overtime. 5-4 to win. Aiden Spellacy, the overtime game winner. It was Randy Hernandez, Aiden Spellacy, and Nick Perkusich each getting a goal and assist. Mercyhurst beating Air Force 6-3. Austin Hademan, a hat trick for the Lakers. Number 10, Wisconsin. Finally, Alex, Minnesota lost a 3-1 victory for the Badgers. For the Badgers. Robbie Bay doing 35 saves. Tarek Baker, a goal and an assist for Wisconsin. Notre Dame, number 18 in the country, beating Arizona State 5-4. Grant Sialanoff and Landon Slagger, two goals for the Fighting Irish. And Michigan State, a come-from-behind win in the third period against Michigan. They get this weekend, weekend split against their rivals, a 3-2 win. Cole Krieger and Josh Nob, they're scoring late to give the Spartans the win. Penn State beating Ohio State 5-2 to split that weekend set. And moving on over to the ECAC now as I look at the clock. We're getting down to the nitty-gritty here. Colgate beating St. Lawrence 4-2. Carter Guylander, second win of the year with 34 saves. Alex Young, a goal and assist, including the game-winning goal. Quinnipiac, another overtime game. They beat Clarkson, though, 4-3. Desi Burgart, two goals, including the overtime game winner. Hockey section, Maine beating Vermont. They get their first win of the year. Victor Osman, 30 saves. Adam Hall, a goal and an assist for the Black Bears. Boston, they get on the board, and they get the weekend split against the Friars, a 6-4 win over Providence. NCHC, number six, St. Cloud, getting the weekend sweep over to the Duluth Fighting, fighting Bulldogs. The Bulldogs, a goal, one nothing. Nick Perbix, overtime game winner, fifth of the season. I love those one nothing games that are like that, Alex. Goaltending duels are great. Western Michigan tying Miami. Broncos, they'll get the shootout in wrapping up the NCHC action, NCHC action on Saturday. WCHA, Lake Superior State beating Northern Michigan 3-2 with an overtime win. Louis Boudin, a goal, overtime game winning goal. Pete Vayette, two goals in the game for the Lakers, five points on the weekend. Alabama Huntsville beating Ferris State 2-0. They get the weekend sweep. As we quickly jump over to Sunday, I'm going to read them really fast. Just the numbers. You can see the stats there. Robert Morris beating Niagara 6-2. Army beating an AIC 5-3. Minnesota getting the weekend split 5-3 over Wisconsin. Arizona State weekend split over Notre Dame 5-3. Quinnipiac 
getting two out of three of the week over the Golden Knights. Quinnipiac winning one to nothing. Then we got Colgate tying St. Lawrence. The Saints still getting a shootout. Boston College wins three to two over New Hampshire. Merrick McLaughlin, the game-winning goal. Northeastern beating Merrimack three to two in that one. And North Dakota getting a three nothing win over Colorado College. They are also playing again tonight. <sighs> I just like sprinted through all of those. <sighs> that was a lot, Alex. It was a lot, but you know what, Tyler? That's okay. We got through it. And you know what? I think it's time we give you a quick second to breathe. Quick second to breathe? Quick second to breathe. We are going to go to a quick commercial break, after which we will have the World Juniors recap with none other than special guest Stephen Ellis. We are going to be back here on the Keel Show on 12 on Sports. We'll be right back. Goodbye. At Amazon, we're pretty good at getting things done. We're pretty good at solving problems. COVID-19 is the biggest challenge we've had to face. The challenges are what motivate us, like flying masks to our employees around the world. We're doing everything we can to get you what you need and doing everything we can to keep our people safe. I'm former Navy pilot, Sarah Rhodes, and I'm proud to lead our Amazon Air Network. Welcome to my bookie. You're ready to create an account and start making money. And we're here to help. And remember, you can get a bonus of up to $1,000 on your first deposit. Now you're ready to bet. Just go to mybookie.ag, visit the sports book, click on your bet, and input the amount you want to risk or win in the bet slip. Yes, it's that easy. Just remember, at my bookie, you play, you win, you get paid. At Amazon, we're pretty good at getting things done. We're pretty good at solving problems. COVID-19 is the biggest challenge we've had to face. 
The challenges are what motivate us, like flying masks to our employees around the world. We're doing everything we can to get you what you need and doing everything we can to keep our people safe. I'm former Navy pilot Sarah Rhodes, and I'm proud to lead our Amazon Air Network. Welcome to My Bookie. You're ready to create an account and start making money. And we're here to help. And remember, you can get a bonus of up to $1,000 on your first deposit. Now you're ready to bet. Just go to mybookie.ag, visit the sports book, click on your bet, and input the amount you want to risk or win in the bet slip. Yes, it's that easy. Just remember. At my bookie, you play, you win, you get paid. And we are back here on the Keel Show on 12 Ounce Sports. Crafted from the crease because we're presented by Second String Leather Company and MyBookie.ag. Joining us now on the show is a writer for the hockey news covering all things hockey, but likes to talk about prospects and providing outstanding coverage of the World Juniors. Which is over, if you guys haven't noticed, unfortunately. If you, if you have noticed, yeah. just, just, just to make sure. It's not, it's not on in the background. we got a blank screen behind us today. <laughs> unfortunately. Now, coming on the show for his second time on TKS, welcome back, none other than Stephen Ellis on the show. Hey, Stephen, how's it going? Good, how are you guys? We Doing great, we're phenomenal we're even. Phen- phenomenal, my gosh, that's like the 20th it. time you said that today, Alex. Good <laughs> golly, he is just, that, that's his go-to word, Stephen, unfortunately. Um, of course, the last time we had you, Stephen, it was just me on, my brother Alex here, likes to think he's funny. I'm the funny one in this show, though, that's for sure. The funny-looking one. See, Stephen, how have you been since the last time we? How's how's it going since the last time we talked? Oh well, it's it's been uh it's been good. A little run here. I'm excited for the start of the NHL season and World Juniors, busy as ever. So I, I can't complain. You know, it's uh, I gotta say I'm, I'm one of the few people who've enjoyed kind of this lockdown to a point because you know it's been more time to watch whatever sports are available and do some fun stuff. So it's been it's been good. Well, that's good. I mean, because. It's been, it's nice because, I mean, I just come home. I don't worry about going anywhere. You don't have to do anything because, I mean, I, I, you know, we're here in Michigan. You're right there in, in, right, out, in right in Toronto. And I get to see the numbers from both for COVID. And it's it's uh, not good on either side of the border, Alex. I can tell you not that. Really. Unfortunately, we're not going to be visiting Toronto anytime soon at this rate. No. But let, let's get to the World Juniors here, Stephen, because it's, because, you know, we, we cheer for Canada on this show and, you know, much to the chagrin of pretty much every single person probably with that we know. I root for North America. <laughs> you you cheer for the North America. Hey, if the World Cup of Hockey comes back, it's going to be awesome. But the, but Canada loses to the United States. And, yes, that's a bummer because, like I said, we live in the U.S. And, you know, when we cheer for Canada, people, I got enough text messages that probably blew up all my data plan. But what is the feeling with team Canada losing? Cause it didn't feel as demoralizing as, you know, the 2017 final, the 13 semifinal, or even, you know, the 2010 final where, you know, John Carlson won it in Saskatchewan. What is the feeling both from, you think from a, you know, team from hockey Canada side for losing this goal in the gold medal game and from a fan perspective of Canada losing in the gold medal game. Yeah, we've had the time to kind of digest it and look at it and say, okay, so here's what happened. It's if you're Canadian, you're looking at this and saying, like, well, this is one of the best Canadian teams we've seen in a very long time, and it's going to sting for a bit that they didn't win. But at the same time, you look at it and say, well, you know what? You watch that final game. I don't think Canada could have done much better in that game. They just they weren't getting lucky on their bounces, and the Americans they they did. They got lucky on the balances, and then the Americans just did a great job of shutting out Canada when it mattered. So uh, I, I think it was a very hard fought game. It's going to hurt looking back and saying like, wow, look at the talent that this group had and how many of these guys are going to be really key NHL players someday. And, and for them to kind of just to fall, to fall to their biggest rivals, it, it will hurt. But it seems like people kind of understood like, you know what, on one hand, we, we got to see some high quality hockey involving 
all of our nations during the Christmas break. You know what? That's that's a bonus in its own, given everything that's gone on the last 12 months. But uh, it, it will definitely... I don't know if it's going to hurt for like for a lot of Canadian fans as much as it did in the past, um, just because like it, it it didn't look necessarily in that championship game like Canada was in control and it wasn't like they blew it in the end like we've seen in the past. So I I, I still think even if all this time back since the game, I, I don't know if we've got really a clear answer on how people feel, but it, it just doesn't seem like it was as big of a deal to lose this year. At least it wasn't a shootout. Let's just be happy about that. <laughs> that is Thank true. God. Thank God. <laughs> and but I say this. I'll say this. I'll, I'll take the shootout over the alternative, which is endless overtime. Which, even though that's probably a better way to end the game, let's be realistic. It's you. You, you can't necessarily. You, you can't keep changing the rules mid tournament. And people were saying like, why some of these semifinal games or whatever, like in the past, they would they would go to a shootout. It's just like you got you do have time constraints. You just. Can't Ugh. play forever, unfortunately. All so right. I understand yeah. that way of it. All right, Stephen, and goodbye. No, I'm down. <laughs> I, 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 I call it the skills competition. I and you know, shoot, you look at 2018 in the gold in the women's gold medal game that was determined by a shootout. I, I've just never been a fan. I get it in in football and soccer, like that's how they've done it for 200 years. But for hockey, I'm like it's a skills competition. You want to end it then the hockey game by playing, but that's just my that's just my rant, and I've probably done that at least. 30 times on the show, probably. That is true. That has been a ongoing topic of discussion, which I usually win, but that's okay. You don't. No, you liar. In this case, I win. That's true. In this yeah, case, two to, two I to win. One, yeah. The guest has my side. Yes. Um, but you did mention that Canada played, honestly, probably the best game that they possibly could, even though they did get shut out. Final score of 2-0 in that game for those that were not able to watch it or hear about it. What do you think made them so successful, you know, over the course of the tournament and then the final gold medal game to to really show how much USA hockey has been able to develop their talent and have like the the top tier talent as similar to a team Canada would? First off, I apologize if I had any connection issues there, but uh, with that, yeah, no, that, was, that was us, Stephen, my bad. Okay, yeah. So the the depth on that team was a shining a point for them. You look at the the goaltending. I know that was something I was actually very high on heading into this tournament, and I thought, you know what, I think the goaltending actually heading in. I thought that I was I was confident in Devin Levi, based off what we saw at the World Junior Hair Challenge and what we know he's capable of. Just give him the chance. He had the chance, and he he stole. Well, I didn't say steal the games, but he kept the games. Uh, in Canada's favor when he needed to. And that's exactly what you're looking for in a tournament like this. The defense was another thing where people are saying, this group's not looking so good on defense. Well, clearly that wasn't a problem because they were the best team at five on five throughout this entire tournament. They were great penalty kill. Everything they kind of did really showed that that was a good defensive team. Then you go to the offense. And this is something where in the past, you've seen them go and they'll bring, they'll bring four lines, but that third line or the fourth line is more of a grinding line. This is all about skill. And that was why that team was out there and it did what they were able to do. And, and the Americans had kind of a very similar team there too, where um, we, we saw with, with the, the Americans was a very skilled team, but they, they had guys who were willing to adjust to different roles. So when you get to that championship game, Canada was going out there and they're playing against a team that was very kind of evenly matched in all the positions. They had the great goaltending of offense, solid defense and scoring on all four lines. And that's why it was a, both teams kind of just really looked good in that regard. But um, I, that was one of the best championship games I've seen in a long time. I don't know how other people feel about it, but I thought that was one heck of a game. And to, just to finish the, the comments on the shootouts, I will also say, if you don't want a shootout, just score another goal beforehand, and then you're good. Oh, jeez. There you that's go. What every, that's what I everybody. Love it. It's so easy. You just got to score. I will say this. that That has been, I guess, the one criticism of the three-on-three three of how exciting it can be, Stephen. But teams have realized that if it's not a perfect rush into the zone, they'll do the turn back and go back again. And it's good. You keep possession in the overtime, but – I guess that's been the problem with it is like some teams aren't necessarily pressing the entire way through, which is what they probably initially thought. So I can see why, like, hey, if you, you got to score, you want to see teams more press, which is why they, I know, because they do that in the World Juniors, they do it in college hockey too here down in the States, the three point system. Steven, kind of off topic here, but would you like to see three points for regulation win, two for overtime win? Would you like, you'd love to see that in, a, in the NHL because it would force teams to try harder. You want to see a goaltender pulled with a tie game, Alex? That's how you do it. Put three points on the line. 
I, I will say I became a really big fan of that format recently more than before because of my playing in NHL 21. If you guys have ever played ESHL, the, yep. the online league, so my team in a lot of the cases, we're just looking to advance each division and we'll get to one game where we're like, okay, it's three, three, two minutes ago. Just play full defense. Don't do anything. Don't even shoot. If you get the puck, just bring it back to our zone. Look, we need that point. That's what matters. And we see that at the NHL. We see that at the levels of hockey. And I don't like it. The NHL, like I know a lot of people give the WHF crap for a lot of their rules and how they're like, they will call hits more aggressively than they would in the NHL. Yeah. But you know what? They, they, they call it to a way that there's no gray room. And I like that. It's it's you you know what you're getting with like a hit from behind will always be a hit from behind. It will not be a, a two minute penalty or a five minute penalty. It's like it's always the same thing every time, and I like that. Um, when it comes to points, I think that's another thing the NHL can really look at and say, you know, this is this is a smart format, and that's more of a thing for um, for tie breaking purposes in the WHF because the tournaments are short. Yeah. But I think that like there might it puts more emphasis in winning in the sixty minutes, and I'm all for it. I mean that it's it's nice because shoot you you see it in college hockey now because I I mean I follow it and I and in the NCAA terms if a game goes to shootout it's considered a tie but for conference and league purposes it counts the extra point and it just makes it a whole hard, lot harder for all of us so I I can see why like a three point system would kind of push that a little bit see now now the three point system I look at it and that's where it, even in overtime the other team still gets a point right no. So it's, it's just three, two, two one. So it's, three for regular season, two for an overtime win. But you get two for you get a shootout win, but the other team gets a point. In overtime in college, at least, you get no points if you lose in college. See, in overtime. I, I feel like it should be the the three point system should be three points for a regulation win, two points for an overtime win, one point for a shootout win. Because why would you and give the a losing team gets nothing? Precisely. Why would you give a losing team any points for participation? No pity point. I mean, pity I get point. it. I get the pity point thing, and, and 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 honestly, it helps a lot of teams, especially towards the end of the season in the NHL, is getting those last points of yep. you know shootout losses or whatever. But I don't know, man. <laughs> a loss is a loss. That should be a zero. <laughs> L is an L. I get the argument kind of like the, the, about giving them the point. It's like, well, you know what? You you lose the – you get zero points if you lose the game in regulation. But if you – regulation comes, 60 minutes is over, and you haven't lost the game yet, you would get that one point in a tie in the, the in the past. So I guess that's why they keep it. Um, I, I would like them to get rid of that, that point, but you know what? It makes it for a more interesting playoff battle down the line. Like – when you look at the the one I like to talk about is the, the 2019 championship when the Blue Jackets, or uh, yeah, when the Blue Jackets went out and beat Tampa Bay. Well, part of the reason why they even made it to the playoffs was because they were just they, they kept getting to overtime and kept getting those extra points. And then we saw what they did against the Lightning. So I think it makes it for some more interesting thing. But I I think if you make it a three two one system, it, it it penalizes the teams for not winning in 60 minutes more. And I think that's okay. Ready to see a 70 point team make the playoffs, Alex? This is how you do it. <laughs> We're thinking of stuff here on the Keel Show with Stephen Ellis from the <laughs> Hockey News. So, jumping back to the World Juniors, you know, the thing we initially had him on for, oh, before yeah, we went on this yeah. whole rant. Um, <laughs> the Ru- Russia doesn't win a medal. And besides Yaroslav Askarov not being able to hold on to his stick for the entire <laughs> tournament, it seems like, what, I mean, was this a team that was. It's just overrated. Did they not step up when they needed to? What was Russia's problem in this tournament, and why were they not able to win a medal at all? So it's funny. For Russia, I either had them coming second place or fourth place, and then I picked them in second place. It would have looked smart because if it actually how the way it worked out is I would have had nailed the top four in my pre-tournament predictions had I stuck with Russia coming fourth place. But um, this is a team that we saw them at the Cardiola Cup, and we saw they could score at will. Askarov was incredible. The defense looked good. And this was pretty much the same team that they brought to the World Juniors. And it just seemed like you just kind of expected like one or two more goals every single night from them. And it, that – was just a kind of a weird thing for them. Like you look at a, Pod Coles, and this is his third tournament. And I believe this statistically was his worst, and and that's something you wouldn't really expect out of a guy who was such a top prospect. Uh, Rodion Amirov was the team's top scorer, and I still wondered like, could he have been better in uh, game to game uh, situations? I do. Askarov, the, the thing about him is he didn't play great in that game against Canada, and he kept losing his stick. But we look at the two games he played against Canada in the pre-term and the playoffs and his team scored zero goals. He just simply can't 
score. You can't win games without scoring goals. So there was to a point, look at Askoff and we're like, oh, you should have been a bit better. But when your team doesn't score goals, what are you going to do? Um, so it just seemed like that team just struggled to score and it shouldn't have, this is a group that you look at the lineup and you're saying like, like Igor Chinikov and he got hurt, but he still only had one point in, in that tournament, uh, as one of the older players that just seemed kind of odd to me. And Paul Coles, it wasn't great. Kusadinov wasn't, he was, he was good. Nothing too fantastic game to game. And, um, you look at that, it, it didn't seem like. Uh, Igor Larionov could really get the most of this team. Now, he's a rookie coach at this tournament. This is his first time doing it. And I think if you give him another chance, he'll attack things differently. But it's like they didn't adjust to when they would get outmatched. They weren't adjusting to it. They weren't trying different things. They weren't coming up with crazy line combinations to make things work. And well, we can also say the defense just overly wasn't great. Like, again, Shakir Mukhamadoulin, I still don't know how he was a first round draft pick in the NHL. I've just watched him so many times and he frustrates me to no end watching that guy play. And he didn't do anything to impress me in this world shooter tournament. So uh, their defense is always kind of a downside. So if you're Russia, you just got to score more goals and they didn't. So it's just like a lot of it just comes down to the fact that only one guy had more than two goals in the entire tournament for Russia, Vasily Ponoryov, and he scored it in the first game. Jeez, that's, I mean, the, that's not great. No. And typically Russia is that high scoring team. And we'll, we'll get to fin- your question with Finland here in a second, Alex, but Yaroslav Askarov went into this tournament with so much expectations, now being the number one guy once again, second year with Russia. But he is, you know, one of the highest drafted goaltenders that we've seen in a long time. Nashville's got him. Did he come off to you? Because I was indifferent the entire tournament about him. Did he come off to you as a goaltender that can be an NHL goaltender soon? And a not just a, you know, making it in the NHL, but a starting goaltender, as I'm sure Nashville's projecting him. Do you think he can be the guy later down the line, or did he kind of you know let you down a little bit? He it was not the Askarov we're used to seeing, but that's also why I don't take especially goalie performances in this tournament too seriously. Like we we look at that and see Devin Levi was the best goalie in the tournament. I honestly don't think he's going to be much of an NHL personally. And when you look at Askarov, I still believe he's the, the, he and Spencer Knight are the two best uh, goalie prospects in the world right now, and I'm holding to that. With Askarov. You look at him playing for St. Petersburg, a team where he's playing in a lot of low scoring games and he's got a 4 3 0 record, which on its own, fine. You know, he's an 18 year old goalie in the KHL. It's pretty hard to be doing that. Very few goalies have ever played as much games as an 18 year old as him. I think Vasilevsky is like the only comparable and he's trying to be pretty good. Yeah, um, it. But his, his goals against average this year is a 0.96. His save percentage is a 0.962. Like he's, his stats are incredible. We saw the Cariola Cup where he just came out there and just like looked out of his mind. He was so good. It just didn't feel like the Askarov in that in that tournament that we're used to. We're used to this guy who's calm, but will be athletic and he he can let him, he doesn't let bad goals bother him. And he's got this good mindset to him. And he's he's just you know, he's got everything you're looking for in a goalie. In this tournament, he was making mistakes with the puck. He kept dropping his stick. He had trouble tracking the puck. It just didn't look he was like he was in the right head space. So I, I'm I don't take a look at if he had lost every game in this tournament, I still don't think it would have changed much for me because it's such a small sample size and everyone's in a different situation when they're playing internationally. Um you're playing harder competition than you're used to on an average night and stuff like that. So I'm not too worried. We've seen what he's been able to do this year otherwise, and we're going to see what he's going to be able to do when he gets back to the KHL playing on a regular basis. I think we're going to be talking about a guy in, in two years is a starting goal in the NHL. Now, the team that ended up beating Russia for the bronze medal was none other than Finland. Now, the Finns have a, a long-storied history of pr- producing high quality talent, talent that can be raised to the top of the draft pool. Who do you think is going to be the breakout star from this performance from the Finns? Now you only get a bronze medal, but even meddling in the world juniors is a great accomplishment to have under your belt. Who do you think is the breakout star that maybe you didn't even expect to play as well as they did, but they exceeded all of your expectations. That's a good question. Um, I, I was a big fan of Topi Nimella, the Leafs prospect going yeah. in, but he was he was my pick for top defenseman in the tournament when I did the voting for, uh, later in the tournament. And, and you know he's he's an 18 year old guy who was a third round pick I believe uh, this year. And it, it, we, we I've seen him play in league of play, and it's like yeah he's good. 
but he took his game to a whole other level that um, the, the one guy who I'd say is good comparable in terms of performance wise was Henry Yoki Haru, uh, but I believe it was two years ago. Yeah. And uh, he had a fantastic tournament. Like every game you watch him, it's like, he's doing something right. And that was Niamela there. Um, and yeah, you know, he's, like he scored a few goals. Like he's not a huge goal scorer. I believe like in, in the last like three years, or something like that, he's got like four goals total in all the leagues he's played in, but he, he went out there, scored twice. He had six assists. He could run the power play, played some penalty kill was kind of their, their do it all man for the Leafs or for their fins. Um, so I think that's one where like we, we knew he was good, but I, I didn't know if he was going to be like NHL material. And in this tournament, like, again, it, it's, you, know, you don't change your opinion drastically on a prospect, but in ter- if I had to give one, it would be him just because I, I don't know if there was a guy as consistent night to night on defense as he was outside of maybe Cam York or Bowen Byron. The, it's funny. Cause I, I remember you talking about that throughout the tournament is you don't want to get too high a stock on someone because of a performance. Because if that were the case, Boyd Devereaux would have been the greatest prospect in the history of all time after the 97 World Junior Championship. But with that said, who did you ex- – I mean, there's, there was a lot of great talent. Tim Stutzla, obviously, despite, you know, German being not the best team, he was able to will them into a quarterfinal spot. I, you know, I, with the exception of that Canada game, Germany – I mean, they had everything going wrong for them for that because of all the, you know, the positive COVID tests, but they still were able to get to that point. I mean, Austria, I mean, their goaltending, holy cow. We, I remember that game. We were watching the game against Sweden. Right, Austria, yeah. Holy cow. We had that game while we we're doing live on the show. We were just mesmerized the fact that Austria was in that game. But overall, who, you know, what, what players kind of impressed you with their play? But who, and like I said, I know you're not, you don't take as much stock as players that don't play well in this tournament. I just talked about Askarov. But who do you think, you know, who are some players that you thought were going to do better, but didn't do as well as you thought they were going to do? Who was, who impressed you and who kind of let you down a little bit? Well, the one guy who really impressed me was Kirill Karazanov on uh, Russia. And, and I, I kind of slammed Russia's defense as being this group that every year it's like, Oh gosh, hate watching them. But for him, it's like, he, he's, he played a lot of minutes for Russia and, and, and where he plays in uh, Scott St. Petersburg, he's always playing in a, um, behind some really good defensemen, so he doesn't get a lot of opportunities to show him, but he was like the go to guy for Russia. Um, and I don't even know if I really would have put him anything higher than the third pairing when this the term started, but he was just he did so much for him. And from talking to some scouts and some other, um, some other people about his performance, it's like, yeah, everyone just had something positive to say about his game. And uh, he, he moved the puck so well, he skated very well, he, he made really smart decisions with the puck. So uh, I really like what we saw out of him. The one guy that just and I mentioned him earlier, sticking with the same team, uh, a guy that really just didn't totally impress me. Uh, actually, you know, I'll, I'll say this. I'll change it up. Cole Perfetti. Um, I knew that we would he was going to be a little deeper in the lineup, but I didn't really see a lot that kind of forced him into a spot where he could play a lot. Like, he's a, go- a guy who's a really good goal scorer, but he's he really improved his playmaking, and his skating was something that scouts and coaches kind of raved about as uh, something that he really improved during the offseason. And I didn't really like his performance as much as I, I was hoping to. And um, when you, when you talk about that Team Canada and, like, look, look at the group that was so good, and um, you, know, you look, obviously, at Dylan Cousins and, and, and Connor McMichael in points and guys like that, but you know, Cole Perfetti was someone I just thought, probably could have got two or three more goals in that, in that tournament to really show what he was made of. And um, he didn't, but again, I, I don't think that really drastically drops him. It's just, I would have loved to see more. I know the name people keep saying is Quinton Byfield, but uh, when you put him on a, a lot of that tournament, he was playing as their third line centerman. I mean, if your third line center is Quinton Byfield, it's going to be very hard in a tournament like this to match another third line center that can keep up with him. So I liked him where he was, but and I thought I was, I thought we should have seen more for Perfetti out of that based off of how we, he usually performs internationally. He, uh, cause Byfield, I mean, last year, for example, everyone's like looking at, Oh, this is Byfield and Lafreniere. Who's going to step up for Canada. Who's going to be the number one overall pick. And then Byfield, you know, just got, you know, thrown to the back. It's like, all right, Dale Hunter's like, all right, guys, uh, no, we're going to take, you know, Lafreniere and we're going to make him the star that he was before and only showed once again, why he was the number one pick. And that's kind of the spot Perfetti got put in. Wouldn't you say Alex? Yeah. <laughs> okay, here's my thing. I I'm I am never and I will never take like any sort of title of being the best person to talk about World Juniors hockey. I always have like my few key players that I watch. Like the next question that I have 
you know, kind of centers around one person or one player in particular. But honestly, I just listen to what people say and what Tyler says because Tyler listens Why to what people say. Why am I differentiated? You are the <laughs> insider of the insider. So you tell me what everyone else says. And I said, that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but talking about the World Juniors, and, you know, players and draft stock and, you know, who did good, who did bad and, you know, trying to take all of this information, all the stats and trying to decide, all right, this player is going to be, you know, number one now. This player is going to be, you know, top five, top ten. We're just uh, just under a month out from none other than Bob McKenzie putting out his first 2021 draft top 10 with my personal favorite at number four, Matthew Benares. I think that's how you pronounce it's it. It's Benares, yeah. Uh, Benares. Center from the University of Michigan. As you can tell, I am a fan. Um, we are fans he here. played for Team USA in the World Junior Tournament, and there was a lot of uh, hype around him. So for me, I think with his performance, I think he kind of stayed right smack dab in the top five of the draft stock for him. But who do you think, who do you think's draft stock rose or fell from their performance in the tournament, given all of the uh, predominating factors, if you will? The fact that you don't really take it into consideration. <laughs> given the fact that you just completely ignore it. No, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to go. Kersanov on Russia being one for sure, where he wasn't getting a lot of ice time. And we know that in the KHL where uh, especially young defensemen is they don't get a lot of ice time because teams aren't worried about the development. If you're, if the plan is to go to the NHL, you're looking to win because KHL coaching lifespans are very short. So you don't have time to rebuild like NHL teams do. So I think he was, did a really good job. Uh, but Matt Beniers is one where I kind of, I wasn't sure if I liked him as like fifth, sixth or seventh for this uh, draft. Um, but he was, he, well, it's not a strong 2021 NHL draft compared to 2020 or even 2022 or 2023. But uh, for Ben years, I thought he did everything you possibly could have asked from him. He was the youngest guy on the team, yet he played a key role. And when, whenever you would talk to Nate Lehman after the games, it's like, who stood out? Who stood out? And Matt Beniers is a name that he mentioned quite a bit. So um, he did a good job. Uh, he he plays fast. He's always on the puck. He's He's got the skill and he can make the plays. Um, so uh, I think he did a fantastic job. Uh, throughout, but and there weren't a lot of other guys that really played a big key role for the team that were 2021 draft prospects. Uh, Stanislav Sovil from the Czech Republic. Uh, I, I'm a huge fan of his. He knows what he's doing with the puck all the time. Um, he's he's someone where he was not kind of like on high on a lot of teams' radars. Um, more so like, like when, when you get a European prospect playing at a high level, you'll be mentioned a lot on like social media and the internet. It's like, oh, look at this guy. It's, it's not as common when you see a Czech Republic defenseman doing so well. Um, but NHL teams kind of see it a little differently. But it seems like they a lot of them really kind of grew on him as the term went on and got to see what he's able to do because he was a young player on a team that was outmatched in a lot of the performances. And we saw what he did against Russia. I thought he was probably one of the best players out there. And I don't think he got a point, but he didn't need to. Um, so uh, I think those are the guys who really did a lot. Um, the one guy I was really hoping we'd see is Jesper Wallstedt from Sweden um, uh, as a top draft prospect or draft goalie prospect for uh, 2021. And he could go in the top 10 this year just solely because the draft's a little weaker um, than usual. But I think that you know, you're still looking at a guy that is so raw, still young. He's actually the youngest player to ever score a goal in the Swedish under 20 league. And he's a goalie. And he, the, the guy he beat out for that was Victor Hedman, which I, so I love that story, but um, Beniers is definitely the number one guy for me that I think like didn't have to jump up a lot, but it's like he he solidified what he could do when the fact that he's the youngest guy on the team and they gave him a key role and it worked out. I uh, you know because you mentioned how the draft class because there isn't many I don't say there's not many prospects but there's not as many guys like oh man who's going to be in the top ten this year this top ten's going to be stacked. What do you mean the third Hughes brothers there? Oh man, yeah because. <laughs> Well, I, I, I've had my things with Jack Hughes, but that's because he got brought into the league too early, and there will be no player ever again brought from the U.S. national development team to the NHL ever again, and I get that. But I'm not saying this is the this, – I don't think this is anywhere near the 1999 draft and how weak that was, you know, except for those Sedin kids. Those were pretty good. Those guys turned out all right. The who's? The, the Sedins. You know, there were two Swedish guys playing Vancouver for 100 years. <laughs> but uh, – you know, this may be a little early time. Obviously, there's a lot of time left. You know, a lot of hockey we played all around the world. But, Stephen, right now, if you could cement a pick to be the number one draft pick this coming off season, who do you think gets that call 
to be the first name called when Gary Bettman, whether it be on Zoom call or actually in an arena, who does he? what is the name he reads off first? It's tough because I, I don't know if everyone agrees with me, but if I had to make the number one pick based off of projection on who I think is going to be the best player from this draft, I think it's Brant Clark. And he's a very cool uh, player. Now he's playing in Slovakia with Nova, Nova Zamski. Um, but, oh, man, I, I've been watching him since he was like Bantam age. And this guy just knows what to do with the puck. He's up exactly what you want in a in a in a prototypical two-way defenseman. That's a lot of kill McCarr characteristics and the way he carries the puck and moves the puck. And um, we looked at the Don Mills Flyers team from 2019 uh, that played in the GTHL and they had Shane Wright and they, yeah. they lost something like one game or something like all year long. It was just like a dominant group, but Shane Wright stole all the headlines, but Brant Clark was the guy who was creating so many of those plays or was getting fed to. And I believe he had over a hundred and something points himself uh, as a defenseman. So I really like what Brant Clark does. He just, um, he played on a Barry team where he was getting a lot of ice time and a lot of uh, options, like a lot of chances to prove himself. And I thought he did a great job, but of course he just plays on playing on a great team. He's not playing a great situation now in Slovakia, but I think there's just, you look at him now and I say, this guy's got the absolute best potential going forward. I just wonder if Owen power goes number one, than other defenseman out of the university of Michigan, just solely because, you know, he's had some really good opportunities this year and he's done everything to, to kind of cement himself there. I just, I, I personally like Brant Clark a bit more. And I got, I've watched those guys since young age and there's just more about Clark's game that I like, but I, I think if I had to put money down on right now, I want to say Owen power goes number one, just because of how well he's playing in college already. Yeah. Good uh, answer. Yeah, yeah, and with it. that, no. <laughs> well, cause I, I remember I talked with Tate Harris, of the O show, the O show podcast, the yep. and he, you know, he said, this was probably two months ago before there was any hockey. Cause we were just discussing, Hey, will the OHL ever come back? And he said, Brant Clark. And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Cause I mean, he was really talented last year. Now he's going to be playing some pro hockey this year. He is right now. However, I will say this with veneers and Owen power, if Michigan can, can continue, if if they don't keep slipping up like losing te- like losing games against like Michigan State, you see teams that are in better college teams get their their draft stock goes up. Spencer Knight, right. if Spencer Knight played for shoot I don't know Robert Morris and been as good, he would not been drafted. But he played for Boston College, so that helps a well, little bit. Well, you also have to put in the fact that this is not a strong draft year. So yeah, the the more American college you know, players are getting a lot more spotlight because, well, at this point, they're the ones that are playing, too. That's, that's another thing that's, that you have yeah. to take into effect. But that's why Canada lost. They didn't play any hockey except for Dylan Holloway. That's why Canada lost. You okay. put, the ast- you, put the asterisks you there. Fine. It's okay. It's all, it's all asterisks. <laughs> Canada didn't play a single game beforehand. Everyone else did. It was unfair. Uh, hey, Canada you, had the longest training camp. Let's not forget that. Well, I don't know. They had, that two weeks off. they had that two weeks off. You know what we need out? They, they still had over two and a half weeks of actual training camp that's true you know what else you know what we need we need a recount <laughs> <laughs> don't <laughs> news talk radio jokes let's go i got them uh <laughs> at steven ellis thn on twitter is where you can find wonderful content from steven ellis our guest here on the keel show steven thanks again for being on giving us all of the best analysis with the world juniors recap that we needed to do that tyler needed to get out of his system so yep. finally i don't have to hear about it it's anymore. been six days <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for being on the show we will definitely talk to you uh further on hopefully maybe next Absolutely. Week. all right see you, thanks so much guys see you steven and that was steven ellis Another fun guy to talk to. Two two timers today. Two two time. Oh my gosh. Two uh, two timers. Two two timers. Is two, this a dance recital? Yeah, you hey, you weren't dancing on any questions like Line A was. Hey, <laughs> hey. Okay. Get get get. Okay. In all fairness, I d- I did not wear this sweatshirt as a plan. As you usual. love that, I get. You're welcome. By the way. Well, well, you're welcome. <gasps> oh, hi, Wixie. Oh, we got a Wixie girl. Perfect timing. It's Wixie. mine. Wixie. Wixie. Oh, she's running around. She's, oh, she's just going to chill up. She oh, wants she to get wants up, to but I, she's like, here, I don't know Wixie, how. Wixie, come over here. Come on. Actually, no, you call her your side. You have less cords. No. Okay, fine. Wixie, come here. Come here, you. So that was. So we'll we'll continue on here. And I think, by the way, talking about the sweatshirt that you gave it's to Wixie. me. It's Wixie. Wixie sighting. Oh, geez. Wixie's like, oh, dear Lord. Oh, turn her around. Turn her <laughs> around. She's, she's, she hates being held like that. She's fine. There we go. You got her? Here, you can take I, the earbud out. I got her. Out. Let me take she's, your earbud out. No, it's fine.
Okay. You don't need that anymore. Okay. Well, okay. She's, Wix- got, she's on it. Now. Hold on. Wixie is on the cord. You take this off now. We got Wixie back on the show making her it's fourth fine. appearance. We got we got we had a second with the corgi. What? If Wixie what? would just I'm just okay. saying. Okay. Back to the sweatshirt. You gave this to me. I didn't here, know Kel- that there's this. Kelly, Kelly put, her, put her on here. See what happens. No, she's put her fine. No, she's gonna freak out if she gets up there. It's fine. She'll just walk back towards us. Back to the regularly scheduled programming. Oh my goodness, Kelly's in here now. But yeah. no, there is this like secret pocket in the sweatshirt. I never even noticed. It's about yay big. You could put like your change in it. And There's stuff. an inside sweater. There's an I inside own that pocket. sweater, and I didn't know that. I've had this sweater for like people are just scared because there's like years. hands coming out from underneath the table. It's Kelly trying to grab the dog. It's our producer. It's our it's our peanut. Oh, here she here we go. Oh, sweet hey, baby Jesus. girl. Don't come back this way. Sit. Sit. She says, Hi. Sit. Wixie, sit. Wixie, sit. I know when they sit up here. Wixie, sit. It's a table. It's cold. It's not cold. It's cold under the Oh, look at that. Look at this. Bite. This is quality TV or, or podcast is, right here. This is content. This if you guys content. are listening to us right now, jump on the YouTube channel because you're obviously you're listening to the replay on the, your favorite podcatcher. Jump on the Kill Show YouTube. And where are we at? The oh, 138. The 138 ish mark. I brushed her this morning. She is on the screen. She's got her corgi butt, six month old Wixie girl. Haley with eyes are cute. Good lord, how did she get? Oh, she's probably rolling on the carpet. That's probably where she's getting this from. All getting this extra from? hair. All like, this extra hair. It's from it, her. Well, she sheds, but she there's sheds. a lot of hair on the ground. Wixie's breed. Corgi shed a I, lot. I, dude. Yes, I, dude. You see, I brush her every morning. I get like a pound of hair off of her. Yeah, well, that's what you get. You get the dog. You get the hair too. Yes, you oh, do. Oh, baby yes, girl. Yes, you do. Alex, Little sausage yeah. dog. Oh, look at her. This is literally. This is gonna be my portrait. We should like some hair on. Quick smile. This is literally going to be our portrait from now on because we have a dog. Here, Fine. yeah. All right, take a picture. Wixie. Boom. Nailed Perfect. It. That is going to be our banner from. But, yeah, no, I did not plan wearing this sweatshirt. I'm just, it, oh, it just happened. I wanted it to be warm in the studio because it's always freezing in here. You're in here with a t shirt and shorts. shorts on. I have, well, like, we t- I turned I have the heat thick, on for you. I have thick socks on. I have moccasins on. I have sweatpants. I have a sweatshirt. How much? Okay. How much did you wear? So yesterday we went and a and a snow cap. We we played pond hockey yesterday over in Muskegon at Muskegon Winter Sports Park, which was very fun, by the way. We got the girls to play hockey with us. That was entertaining. Yeah, and they they did pretty good. They did pretty good. They, they did pretty, pretty, good. pretty good players. But like, how many how many layers were you wearing? If you're having a problem with how cold my my apartment is, how how much how many layers were you wearing yesterday? Then this, I was wearing. This number of layers, except for, I guess, my undershirt instead of a T-shirt a was a long sleeve. sleeve. Yeah. Well, Other than that, yes, your your office is just slightly warmer than outside about a stone's throw away from Lake Michigan. I will say this. I feel <sighs> bad for your wife. Well, I, I did wear my long johns I'm yesterday. Sorry, I always wear long johns because well, when we were growing up, we played pond hockey. We we figured out how to. Are you trying to get her to sit? I was I was trying to get her corgi butt. No, no one wants no one wants to see her butthole. Okay, not her butthole. It's got a it's got a tail covering. There is no tail. Did you do you see a tail on this dog? There's a tail, right? It's okay. It's like a little bit of hair that's where the tail should be. No, there's a tail. You could no that 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 is foam. You don't want any. I guess you just don't have a tail. Anyways, Alex, are a sausage. We should let's get to the the waiver wire. We had a lot of waivers today, Alex. Let's Waver, I barely even know her. I was, I, 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 I did tweet, I did tweet something out today oh, that was. Oh, you scary with the dumps. Oh, look at, don't, Wixie, don't step over the mixer, please, for the love of goodness. Hi, Fifi. Because I, do you have anything to say to the people? Oh, look at that. That's so sweet. Yeah, and you say never... Cooper loves, or no. she loves Cooper more than me. Oh, she the only reason why she freaks out when Cooper comes over because he's over here less often. She likes people that. Ah! She I likes surprises. It's, I'd say it's about once a week. You guys are about the same kind of rate of arrival. What the hell? Why is Cooper all, <laughs> or here over all the time? Why don't you invite me? You invited me we once. Do. We do. You only invited me once in the past three weeks. I'm just saying. Fine. So, yeah, but say you can just come over whenever. Actually, just text. Okay, me well, right. I don't know when Cooper's over here, so I'm just not gonna come over here. Do you at need Cooper's six Cooper's number? Do you no, need, I don't yeah, want Cooper's number. I'm gonna number. give you Cooper's number. He's a weirdo. Whoa! Wow. He smells funny. Kelly, well, yes, because he's a weirdo. We're a band of weirdos. That's what we do. You should have. Hey, even Kelly was entertained by us two last night, which was a first. Then again, you had how many of those apple pie drinks that you made? They're walking out. <laughs> She's. Like an alcoholic Are you kidding me? I'm the one that has Bailey's in his coffee almost every day. So you're not the alcoholic in this family. There's a lot of alcoholics in this family. There's no <laughs> one specific. Say bye, Wixie. Goodbye, everybody. Oh. Brought to you by Second String Leather Company, crafted from my butt. <laughs> what the? 
gonna you gonna dub that one, Alex? Give me a watch yeah. Band give her a wa- oh yeah, watch band. We gotta get a watch band for her because she has. For the record, I didn't say that. Wixie said that. That's true. Wixie's well, that was clearly Wixie's voice. Uh, the products are so good, and she's just got a nice butt. That's all. Hashtag corgi butts. It's a thing. Hashtag corgi butts. Oh, that's a good dog idea. Dog collars. We should get no second string leather. That's a good idea. A lo- hey, a dog collar. Oh, n- no, look what she's done. Now she's go. back in here. Well, Whatever. She's Who in cares? Here now. Um, she pees, waiver wire. Really Let's it. get back into where is the waiver wire? Where did you throw it on the it's script, right underneath Tyler? Stevens, right there. Just a few of them. Ah, yes. Okay. So, so we'll get to the division previews here in a second. Make our predictions. Obviously, we had a couple of big name guests. A couple of big guests coming next week too. Yes. Uh, but the big names that were put on waivers, the I would say the one that surprised me the most, purely on the basis that they literally just signed him, yeah, no was Corey Perry from Montreal. He was put on waivers just the other day. Um, and this was someone that we talked about when they picked, when Montreal picked up Corey, or Perry, if you want to say, was Where's that this, Perry? this is the this waiver is, wire. This was a great, pick up from them, you know, something that I think that they really needed. They needed some seniority Veteran on, grip. on the for, on the forward lines. Cause you know when you lose Pacietti and you lose, you know, however much they've lost in the past couple of seasons, you know, they don't have Dome or they, no, they do have Dome. Nope, nope, no, they, they traded, don't have yep. they traded him. Traded him for Josh Anderson, which we'll get to. Which they they don't have Dome anymore. They don't have, you know, they don't have Pacietti that they don't have anybody anymore. All like all of their, you know, big talent that they used to have when they were, you know, competitive and, you know, going after Boston and the Boston and Montreal rivalry was an actual thing. I mean, they, they don't really have that much left. Right. I mean, who's their the big guys that I can think of off the top of my head? It was Corey Perry for a hot second, but all I can really think of is is Price and Weber and Price is on his last legs it kind of seems like even though he's been holding this team together just by a string and a prayer and Weber who is an unreliable health concern who at the, at another extent can be is he's is a that, defensive is that, that's is that you put it nicely Alex he's a defensive reliability Reli- he is well, a, no, no he's a defensive liability that's what I said. You said reliability. I, I you know what I mean, not what I say, man. He's a defensive reliability. Well, that means he's just fine, Alex. Well, he's reliable when he's on the ice, but he's never on the ice because he's always hurt. Yep. He's like Carl. He's like the Carlson for Montreal. He's always hurt, and you know when he is on the ice, hey, he might score a goal, maybe. Um, but that's a big thing. Louis Erickson for Vancouver. This was just a bound. This was just bound to happen. Well, it took I'm so. Sorry. This is literally the only reason why they could do it this year was because you can let a guy just you could. That's a contract you can kind of bury because it's almost it's like nine hundred twenty five grand if you if he gets to the minors gets protected. Kind of bury? No, that's a that's a straight up bury. Like well, that. he's he's getting paid six mil, so the Canucks will only have to pay like five and a, five and three, uh, four and three quarters. Well, that's also or four and a quarter. But that's six that they don't have to put towards the cap. You have to remember that. Five and a quarter. Yeah, but yeah, you're right. That's sure. money they don't have to pay for. But I mean, it, Louis it's a Eric's, variable contract. It's a, it's six literally mil, six feet under. Boston and Vancouver have both wanted Erickson out. It just took Vancouver a lot longer to do it. So it's good to see him out. Big one coming out of. We'll skip the Islanders one here for a second. We'll let you mention that Matthew Perot, a guy that's been a part of. We talked about Ken Weeb. You know, being a guy that's been part of that team for now going into their 10th season with Winnipeg, not anymore. Matthew Perot. Yeah. He, he's he been, I mean, yes, his production's declined, and he's not the same Perot as he 2015 or 20, you know, even 2018. But, you know, it's a this is a ever-changing Jets team, and unfortunately he's not able to fit in. I think it's just another one of those cases where... I, I don't mean to be that guy, Alex. I know. We should just read the names because... Hey, we got one more commercial break, and know, we got to go through the rest of the league. I know. Trust me. I know. But <sighs> teams are shedding the fat, yep. um, which is a case with – we'll just go with it with uh, Islanders and the Lightning. Islanders putting Thomas Hickey and Andrew Ladd, a guy who used to be a huge guy for them, um, and Tampa Bay putting Tyler Johnson and Luke Shen on the waiver wire, if you will. $5 million. Five million dollars. Teams Tyler are just Johnson. trimming the fat as much as they can, and that's the best you can really put it at. 
That, that's that's a bummer. Well, Tyler Johnson's been a while, but Luke Shannon, I thought he played a big role last year for that team in the playoffs. He did, but you know, it's it's just a matter of you know what can they play with, right? Exactly. And while the NHL players and teams are trimming the fat, we're gonna chew on some gristle, What's taking that? you to commercial. <laughs> chew on that. We'll be back. After this. Worst commercial outro ever. What are you talking about? You have no idea. <laughs> At Amazon, we're pretty good at getting things done. We're pretty good at solving problems. COVID-19 is the biggest challenge we've had to face. The challenges are what motivate us, like flying masks to our employees around the world. We're doing everything we can to get you what you need and doing everything we can to keep our people safe. I'm former Navy pilot, Sarah Rhodes, and I'm proud to lead our Amazon Air Network. Welcome to my bookie. You're ready to create an account and start making money. And we're here to help. And remember, you can get a bonus of up to $1,000 on your first deposit. Now you're ready to bet. Just go to mybookie.ag, visit the sports book, click on your bet, and input the amount you want to risk or win in the bet slip. Yes, it's that easy. Just remember, at my bookie, you play, you win, you get paid. And we are back here on the Keel Show on 12 Ounce Sports. Hashtag craft for the crease. Why? Because we are sponsored and brought to you by. Second string leather company crafted from the crease. Hashtag and mybookie.ag. They're, they're down there in the corner, and second string are there in the corner, and second string is like up here. Guy, I gotta get there. All right, here we go. This is the literal. All right. This is literally the sprint. This is because I don't. Do we want to go over time today? Gentlemen. I got this. Do it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Keel no, Show no. Sprint. Welcome to where the, it is an hour and forty minute sprint, where you have to cover. Just oh, about Alex, 31 it's, it's just, teams. It's just 40 minutes, Alex. 40 minutes? What are you talking about? Oh, snap. 40 <laughs> Wait, minutes. Wait, hold on. Okay, let's, let's figure it out. All right, let's in here. Before, we got 40 before. minutes. We got, rough. Well, let's talk about 30 teams because we already talked four about divisions. Winnipeg. Four divisions. Okay, now hold 40 on. 40 minutes. Hold on. That's 10 minutes of division. Do we want to go overtime? Carry the two. Hold on. Do you want to go no. overtime? No, we don't. We don't want to go overtime. No, because okay. I have school. And I have, I do have work. And work right now for News Talk Radio is kind of a thing, and it's kind of assess Business <laughs> is a booming. Oh, we're making bank. Hi, welcome to Michigan. Welcome. Open carry's no longer allowed at the Capitol. <sighs> Rights! <laughs> Left. Rights! Left. Rights! Oh, did you guys hear that the Capitol got stormed the other day? Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Dude, the <laughs> best world championship Sally ever. <laughs> Best world Junior Sally ever. Storm the Capitol. We got the Russia. gold, and now we're taking over. Russia. Well, because here's the thing about that. So quickly before we go. I was like. We in a relative term here. And just because we are technically American citizens. The thing There's is. There's no technical. It is technical. 
No, it's not. We're American <laughs> citizens. Anyways, I was like, had Canada won, I think it would have been a little bit more humorous, but I was like still mad from that loss that I was even more mad that the stuff was going on. I'm like, why are you doing this now? Damn, uh, the United States really took that loss real bad. <laughs> I mean, you. oh, yeah, Russia can kicked off their plane after winning 2011. <laughs> Canada, hold my beer. And, you know, my AR. <laughs> America. You know, anyway. you know what, you know what Canada was holding? Nothing. Because they're you know what Canada they was holding, or what the United States was holding? A barrel. <laughs> a ba- oh, don't I? I'm not gonna get into that. Bin gate. <laughs> Bin gate. Trash gate. <laughs> Tra- can barrel gate. All right. So we'll start off with the North Division. We won't talk about Winnipeg, the Scotia North Division, by the way. Scotia Bank paid 2.5 billion dollars. I have no idea how much they paid for the rights, but anyways. Okay. Let's uh, what's first, Alex? Uh, we should go Not Winnipeg. Let's go with Calgary. Calgary. They lost in the round one last year to Dallas in hilarious fashion after Kachuk got injured. Yeah, he got injured. Could have played game seven, but they didn't make it there. Jake, they get Jacob Markstrom. They get Chris Tanev on the back end. People are calling him the Calgary Canucks, which is kind of funny. The biggest thing, I think, Alex, with Calgary is can Jacob Markstrom be the same Jacob Markstrom with a different team. He he was a Vesna caliber goaltender. Had Vancouver made it to the Stanley Cup Finals, Alex, maybe he would have been a Consumite Trophy winner, even though Thatcher Demko got that team to game seven in or or lost in round two. Yeah, lost in round they no, hold on. He got them to against Vancouver. Holy cow, I forgot I was trying to figure out which team I was talking about. But I don't know if he can do it again though. That's a tough part. Different scenario and there's been a lot of behind the scenes talk about how he's been kind of a tough guy to go with. I and Chris Tanev, I think that's an addition that they need. I mean, they lose TJ Brody, but he wasn't really the biggest, you know, he wasn't the same TJ Brody, I'd say, in 2015. I like the fact that he can go in there and help out an aging guy like Mark Giordano. Yes, he won the Norris two years ago, but he's still <laughs> almost 37 years old. He's not a, not a young little scallywag, Alex. So he'll bring a little bit of stability to the defense. He's not a big offensive guy, even though he scored that big overtime winner against Minnesota in the qualifying round that got Vancouver into the playoffs. But the the big questions are still there. Is Sam Bennett still going to be a guy that they're going to rely on? Or in what capacity? Is What's Johnny Hockey, what's his reliability like? You know, yeah, he may put up 50 points this year, maybe a point a game player in the regular season, but come playoff time, if Calgary's able to make it through, is he going to be their guy? Is he going to flame out, no pun intended, just like every uh-huh. other playoff? I'm pretty sure I've said that about every time with Johnny Hockey, flame out, because that's what he does uh-huh, in the playoffs. Dude. How important? I mean, Kachuk's going to obviously have to be the leader of this hockey club. I, It's a big question mark. Are they good enough to make a playoff run? I think they're good enough to make the playoffs, again, be a top-four team in this division. I just don't know if they're able to make a run to the cup. Because then you have to go up against the North Division again, and then you have to go up against whoever it's comes a 50, out of the East. It's a fifty-fifty shot for me of whether or not they can make it to the make it past the first round. I right. think I think Calgary can make it to the playoffs. I think they're one of the four teams in my eyes, but it's getting past that first round. Yeah, and I think with the talent that they have, it's it's going to be tough. They don't really have a lot of firepower that can get them deep, and it's just a matter of. How well can they keep the puck out of their own net? Yeah. But moving on to the other side of the Battle of Alberta, Speaking we have... Speaking of teams with goaltending problems... We have Edmonton, who lost in the qualifying round to Chicago. Um, James Neal is currently deemed unfit to play. Uh, was there any details on uh, that? Or it no? sound, it, he, was on, he wasn't quite the COVID list or whatever, but that's going to be... The unfit to play, the not eligible to play, that's going to be... I mean, there have already been... Games delayed. Dallas. Already, yeah, we'll get so. to Dallas in a little bit. They're not playing until the 19th now. Vancouver came back to practice today. We'll get to that in a minute. But, but yeah, no. Ed, Edmonton is. And I have to agree with, with Ken Weeb on this one. Koskinen and Smith. Koskinen's been ever so ever not reliable. Uh, Mike Smith was good at times in that series against Chicago, but there's a reason why Koskinen got in towards the end of that series. Smith's getting older. Oscar Kleffbaum's going to sit out the season because of his shoulder. And, yeah, you have still have Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid and Nuge and you now Darnell Nurse on the back end. And you got the talent, but the depth. It's the question again. Right. And with 
Oscar Clefbaum sitting out the season due to a shoulder issue and Jesse Pugliarvi being back in the roster. That's a big um, question on how he's going to fit in because of how he left. That is, that is going to be um, something that is going to be daunting over them the entirety of the 56 games. We're running out of time quickly. <laughs> games. I know. Um, moving on to Montreal, they lost in round one to Philly. They traded Max Domi and Anderson and signed Corey Perry and Tyler Toffoli. Poor Go Perry on. not being on the waivers. Well, he is on the waivers. Uh, well, is he on the waivers? He's still, uh, yeah, he's put on today. So he has, if he clears by tomorrow, he could go down to Laval, but he won't go to Laval. Um, Jake Allen backing up uh, Carey Price with a nice, pr- pretty nice mask there, Carey Price. Oh, yeah. Um, this it's funky team, looking, but. This team could make the playoffs. I mm, I like their goal. You I, say that they could make the playoffs. I don't. It's it's going to be tough. It's going to be a dogfight. I, I, I think there's a it's tighter than I would say the other four, the other three divisions. They are going to get. They're going to be the team that gets beat up by Calgary. Goaltending tandem. That's that's my thing with them is they have a good. And this year especially, you're going to need two good goaltenders. So I like Montreal in that aspect. And maybe Josh Anderson has a breakout year. That is true. Tyler, you want to take the next two? Ottawa, the Ottawa Senators, the nation's capital in Canada, finished seventh in the Atlantic this year. However, here's some new names Alex, you're going to be ready for. Derek Stepan, guy in the trade. Evgeny Dadinov got him from Florida. Austin Watson, he may be a jerk. He's still pretty good. Erica Branson, Braden Coburn, Tim Stutzla. They drafted him, Alex. Alex Trebek drafted him. Rest in peace. Okay. He drafted him. Sorry, I mean slap his heart. And Alex goaltender, Matt Murray. I'm not saying they're a playoff team, guys, in Ottawa. Watch out, though. I'm doing my Lee Corso on Kirk Herbstreet. Watch out. Watch out. <laughs> Toronto, no, I, can see, I see them making the playoffs. They they can, have, they're my top four team. Hold on. We'll get to that in a second. We'll give our picks here. Toronto. Lost to Columbus in the qualifying round. But they have some new faces, too. Joe Thornton, Jumbo Joe, Wayne Train Simmons, Newmark, or Scarborough boy, Zach Bogosian on the back end, TJ Brody on the back end, Jimmy VC. Remember that college guy? Remember, he was pretty good in college. Has kind of flamed out, but maybe he has an opportunity. Rookies, Nick Robertson and Miko Lettinen. Maybe Nick Robertson, line. star defenseman. Star defenseman, Nick Robertson. And, you know, they lost Kapanen and Janssen, but... Listen, I think they got some players here that, I mean, they got the grit that they needed, the, the veteran status that they need, and if Marner and Matthews can produce and Freddie can play well and Campbell can back up well, this team will be good. Yeah, we talked about Winnipeg, but the last team in the north is Vancouver. They lost in round two to Vegas. Um, Braden Holpe and Thatcher Demko to split time. That is a tandem that Tyler is Ooh. excited about. That's going to be one. Uh, Nate Schmidt joining the blue line. Um, this is possibly the last year for Edler. It's his last year on his contract. They may sign him again. I don't know how long you're going to prolong that. They, I don't know how deep their Utica system is. I know Utica Comets have struggled over the last couple of years in the AHL. I don't know how good their defense core is. But, you know, if they can put it around. I, I like Vancouver. I, I thought they, they were really close to beating the number one team in the, in the Western Conference in the playoffs. But it'll be tough. Uh, prediction time, I think, Alex. Prediction time. So I have in my top four, in no particular order, Toronto, Ottawa, Vancouver, and Calgary. Those are my two. So you're saying Montreal. Montreal and Edmonton. Edmonton and Winnipeg. Montreal, Edmonton, and Winnipeg are not going to be in the playoffs. I My quick pick here, because I'm going to try to keep this for everyone here. Um, Toronto, Montreal. I'm, I'm going in order here, one to, one to seven. Toronto, Montreal, Calgary, I want to say Ottawa, but I got to give it. I said Calgary. I'm going to give it to I, Vancouver's four. Winnipeg, Ottawa. Did I say I, uh, Edmonton. <laughs> Edmonton may be may, Edmonton may be last this year if they fall at any point during this year. Because don't forget, as great as last year was, Alex, they hadn't made the playoffs since '17, right? That's the, fair. And the reason why is because they have these long droughts of losses, and they've done it. Yes, they made the playoffs in. 2020. They made it in 17. Oh, six. What a great year that was, Alex. But since then, they've had these great, they've had talented, and maybe not great teams for Kevin Lowe years, but they've had talented, they have talent, they just can't put it together. So that's why I think they'll finish at the bottom. These are literally as I'm on the fly. I may be wrong. Edmonton may finish second, but they could easily finish last. I like Ottawa. Montreal will be better. Vancouver's still going to be good. But the Leafs have had this knock on wood. They've had this long history of doing well against the Canadian teams for the most part, either splitting or taking the season series. They usually go out west and do just fine. This might be the year that Toronto actually gets past the first round purely on Simply the Simply because they're playing a Canadian team. They don't have to play Boston. 
I want them to play Boston. I want. Well, have we? They, they possibly yeah. could play Boston, just not anytime soon. Um, with that, that is the it for Scotia North. We move on to Mass Mutual East. Mass stands for. Wait, no, Massachusetts probably right. I don't know. Massive. It should be Massachusetts. Get it? Because Massachusetts. Shush. Massachusetts. Well, Thank Boston you. lost Mass. Um, they lost <laughs> Chara and Krug on the back. They lost end. Mass. Six foot nine of it. Uh, Chara to Washington and Krug to St. Louis. They lost in round two last season. They did win the President's Trophy, and Patrice Bergeron was named captain after Brad Marchand decided to give it up after holding it for 15 seconds. Um, this, they're still Boston. I think that they still are competitive, even though they they lost two key players for them. Chara was not a huge part of the team, other than for you know being a huge. Um, point of huge hey. physical specimen <laughs> no here here's my thing about boston losing a seven foot stick is a hard thing to do that is tough the thing is with boston literally like I, how can you lose it it powers over everything what i said last week about Char- when charo did sign with washington i said this about boston they will win this division and i'll say it in a second. they'll win the division but they're not gonna win a cup this team is getting too old they're the depth now is starting to dwindle away because of contracts and because of age they're not going to be as good. Yeah, Tuka Rask will be good. You know, maybe have Halak be and have another great year. Boston's just they're in the playoffs. I don't see them succeeding. They'll win the division. They're just not going to go far. Yeah. Um, moving on, we have Buffalo finished sixth in the Atlantic. Uh, Zemgus Gergensen's uh, is out for the season with a hamstring. They added Eric Stahl and Taylor Hall. Eight million dollars, which is going to be uh, a a good thing for them. But is it's the question of can Skinner bounce back? Can, I I hope so. I want Buffalo to do well because whenever they beat the Leafs, it seems demoralized. It's like when Detroit beats the Leafs. I'm like, man, how do you lose to a team that you should beat? But now I think Buffalo's gonna be better. Goaltending will still be a question. Linus Allmark is seemingly gonna be the guy they're gonna try to run with this year. Carter Hutt maybe like a literally a pure split time between the two goaltenders. See who they can run with. They should be better. But then again, I've said this for half a decade, so I I don't know with with Buffalo. Uh, I, they may not be towards the top, but they'll do better than our next team, though. Yeah, Te- a team that rightfully so deserves to never be good ever again. Wow. New Jersey, I'm calling you out. I don't like you. It's because of ever. Me. What's maybe, up? Maybe if you're in East Rutherford, we wouldn't have this problem. But you're in Newark. You know what's good in Newark? Nothing. Driving by it. <laughs> Going around it. No. You finished awful in the Metro. Finished not good in the Metro. <laughs> the best player in your entire organization has decided to retire. Because he was like, yeah, I got my two cups. I'm fine. Corey oh, wait, Cro- by the way, two cups that he didn't win in New Jersey. Corey Crawford, by the way, as we're talking about, he just said, because he was going to take time off, and he decided to retire. So there hasn't been any more on the story on that. There hasn't been a reason why. It's just he decided to call it quits. So, which is, and once again, it's another thing of they signed him, so they wanted him to play. So you wonder if it's a medical reason, a personal reason. We'll have to keep our eyes and ears open for that. What, what's I? You put on the script. Are there any expectations for this team? My expectation is for them to suck. You are bad. I okay. Go home. Good day, sir. I'll say this. Mike, drop. Jack Hughes will do better, but that's it. I think he'll have a better year, but that's it. That's Poor really guy. all I got. That's all I got for Jack Hughes. Yeah, yeah. that's all they have is Jack Hughes. Man, well, you think PK will be Jack better? Jack Hughes. Do you think back? Do you think PK will be better now that he's single? Dude, PK can. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not gonna say. Next, any. the Islanders lost in the conference final last season. They lost Devin Taves and Thomas Grice. Ilya Sorokin uh, joining the team, and Barzil has signed. This is a team that should do better. Should they, should should. I do. think in this division, the way it's laid out, they'll finish towards the top. I don't know how good they're gonna be, but they're they're get, my th- well. We'll get to them. They are still. I mean, they still have Varlamov. Ilya Sorokin is probably the best goaltending prospect coming into the league this year. I, you know, he's better than I mean, Igor Shesterkin. We'll get with the Rangers here in a second, but he's got a lot of capabilities. I think learning from Varlamov and being a one B with him will definitely do him some good. Maybe if it is just a backup role for his first season, that could do well. I like where the Islanders are still at. They may not be flashy. They may not finish at the top of this division, but they'll be a good hockey team and they'll be a tough team to play in the playoffs like they've been the last couple of seasons. Right, and the other New York team, well, well the, the other uh, Metro New York, the other team that's named New York, the Rangers lost to the Hurricanes in the qualifying round last year. 
Um, they should be doing good. They draft the Lafreniere, Igor Shosturkin, and Alex Georgiev will be the goaltenders for them. You still have Panarin. You still, they still have Zibanejad. Has, is Tony D'Angelo playing the left side? I don't know. Why are you asking me? It's a joke, Alex, because he's 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 uh he's uh he he had to go off Twitter. <laughs> Oh, well. <laughs> Tony, D, this is why, folks, if you're an athlete or a high standard, you should just stay out of politics as much as possible because people will tear you a new one if you choose the wrong side. Tony That's D'Angelo, true. exhibit A. But I, I, I want the, like, I mean, you think, oh, you lose your long They're course, not going to be bad. They're not going to be bad. It, it, there'll be a team that's They need gonna, a new garden. But they're not going to be bad. I'm going to fight you. <laughs> we saw that Zamboni. That Zamboni was cool yesterday. They, at the Muskegon Winter Complex, quick. Tyler, I've seen that Zamboni a old bunch Zam- of times. Old Zamboni at Mass Square Garden, literally from MSG. Rangers should be better. I like where they're at. Boy, they'll be a tough team. They'll be a tough team to beat, but they'll be a tough to make the playoffs. That's right. Next team, we're going to talk about both the Pennsylvania teams. Philly first, Fay. lost in the second round. Carter Hart was had a breakout season. He's going to be doing hopefully better this year. Well, well at wa- least he, his team's going to do hopefully better. He wants to be the number one goaltender in the league. He said it in a presser today. Um, Not high Nolan feelings. Patrick's return is questionable. He missed last scene with a last season with a migraine disorder. He has been skating. And he has been skating, but that is a huge question, especially with the toll that the schedule is going to take on players. Um, there's going to be a lot of things that go down, so it's a matter... I don't I don't know if that's going to be a thing or not, um, but Philly is going to be a team that's going to be eh, they were kinda, they 50-50. Were, had season gone 82 games, Alex, they would have won the division last year. They would have won the Metro. That's probably true. Yep. Uh, moving on, we have Pittsburgh. They lost in the qualifying round to Montreal. Ha! Yikes. Uh, no Murray here, so Yari's going to be taking care of that. Um, Kappen added to the lineup, but I think there was some trouble around him. I think he was taken off. Uh, I think he was not eligible or something like that. What happened with Kasperi Kapanen? Here, you keep reading the points, and I'll find it. I think there was something about his... Uh, to arrive on Pittsburgh on Saturday. Okay, it's probably some... Immigrant. Well, similar that's, to uh, Antonio Dobin. Yeah, uh, that's right. So, so, yeah, something with his... Uh, just Visa, come, getting yeah. back... Um, at the beginning of camp, so that hopefully that doesn't play too much into that. Uh, Patrick Hornquist uh, traded for Michael Matheson. Um, the old guys, this question is, are they going to be able to keep this team together? Um, practice canceled last week due to possible coronavirus exposure. This is something that, but the big question of, like, are the old guys going to be able to keep this team together? I think that's the big question. And it's, I, it's, it's, Crosby's always going to be, He's a generational talent. I think he's always going to be able to keep that C on his chest and he's going to be there until he retires. And it's the same thing with Malkin the, is a huge problem for me, both as he a, may be on his way out. I think it it's won't a, be it, this year, but it it's may be a in the huge attitude thing. He doesn't have to fight with Kessel anymore, <laughs> even though they were two of the best players in the league. Well, yeah, but they, they, were together. they kept going after their freaking necks hey, the entire time. Hey, listen, because you don't like him doesn't mean you can't succeed with him. Fair enough. Um, they're, they're getting old. They're, they're in trouble. But it's it, they're similar to the next team, Alex. Right. Washington, who has gray all over their beards, uh, lost in round one to the Islanders. The goaltender situation is up in the air with Craig Anderson on a PTO and Ilya Samsonov looking to Samsonov, be the... Samsonov, but yes. You had it. You, yeah. It's Samsonov. It is. Okay, Samsonov um, being the next in line to inherit that crease. Yikes. Um you add Char to your lineup, but also you're adding Char to your lineup. Yikes. Uh, <laughs> um, Ovi's years are getting up to him. He's not playing to his greatest potential, but he's still Alexander Ovechkin, so take that as you will. 35 for him. 35 uh, goals. All right, quick picks. Quick picks. Tyler, you go first on the four. Uh, Boston. I'm going to go Boston, Philly. I don't know if Philly's – I just feel like Boston. They'll do the thing. They'll win the division, but Philly will go second. Third, I'm gonna. You know what, Alex? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go high up here. Give it to the Rangers. I think it's gonna be Boston, Philly, Rangers, Islanders, and then you're gonna have, I think Pittsburgh just missing out, Philly, Washington, New Jersey, New Jersey by a landslide though, like just Detroit bad this year. Yikes! That's how the guy was going. My right. four has to be Boston. Uh, you're not. Island- you're not in order, though. I know, not in any. Not in any I'm order. I'm in order. Alex isn't. Boston, the Islanders, Rangers, and I'm going to give it to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is going to shut down Washington. You think they're going to make it as per usual? That's what I said about last week, though, about Pittsburgh and Washington. Pittsburgh as is not. As, Pittsburgh as long- is not bad. 
I just want to state that. They're not good as they were, but they're still not bad. As long as 8 and 87 are put on the sweater every night for their teams, they're going to fine. They're gonna try to make the playoffs. They'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, now we move on to the Central Division, brought to you by Discover Card. Uh, we start off I with have the Canes. Uh, Carolina lost in round one to Boston. Yeah, it, it just happened. Um, after it's my, honestly, it's, 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 this is the contract year for Sveshnikov, Nietzsche, Nietzsche, and Martinuk. Uh, this is basically the same team. Can they improve? Uh, yeah, I think honestly with where this every, division, I think, I think they might be at the top of this division. Honestly, it's, it's a, it's a tough battle or it's not really a tough battle, but it's quite an even playing field that they can do well. And then there's, can there's succeed. a couple good teams in this division. But then there's a couple of teams that will struggle mightily. Yes. So I, I like where Carolina's where they're at, and I, I they'll be I I don't see they're not I don't see them not as a playoff team. Uh, Chicago is the there's next, a non playoff team. Uh, they lost in the first round of Vegas last year. Um, Connor D'Elia and Malcolm Subban are their tandem as of right now. Oh my gosh! Did you mean to say Taves right there? Yeah, that's Jonathan Taves. Tyler, that's not how it's spelled. Jonathan Taves is spelled different from Devin Taves. I'll prove it right now. Oh, okay. That's what, oh, that's what I meant. To, okay, that's what I was asking. I was asking yep. wh- which Taves. Oh, nice. So Devin, dang it! I did. Some, gosh darn! Autocorrect. Okay. So is that Jonathan Taves? It or? is Jonathan Taves. Okay, Jonathan Taves is not starting the season to, due to an undisclosed medical condition. Apparently, uh, like a lot of people know about, it. like Kane knows about it, but it's private. Of course, so, he knows so. about. It. He knows everything. Patrick Kane literally knows They were going to be on the same cover together before Patrick Kane was accused of doing something. But anyways. Uh, and Kirby Doc is to go, he's going to be missing a couple months uh, is it due three, to... Is it three to five now? Because it was four to six when he first broke it. Uh, I, I, he, I don't know, but he's going to miss at least a couple months. It'll be the um, playoffs by the time he comes back. Due to his but wrist injury. They're not going to do well, nope. and that's fine. They won't be the worst. Well, I don't know, actually. Hold on. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Uh, Columbus lost in the first round of Tampa last year with Corpusella and Merzlikens. Elvis doing Merzlikens. Yeah, fine. Merzlikens doing Down this there thing. in Columbus. <laughs> Why do we use the South accent for Ohio? Because there's the southern there's border Toledo. of Michigan and the south. There's the Exactly. There's Toledo, Cedar Point, and the South. <laughs> Except for Pittsburgh. No. Pittsburgh's different. Anyways. Pennsylvania's Keep going. East. Columbus. Uh, Oliver Bjorkstrand. Uh, Big extension. Signs a 5 by 5.4 million uh, extension. Extension. Max Domi coming into the fold. They're going to be a mid-team in this division. It's going to be hard to say how well they do in the playoffs, two, though. Two all-star caliber goaltenders. Max Domi. You know he's going to want to step up with a new team. He's got that. You still have Foligno. Pierre-Luc Dubois, I know there's all that talk about does he want to be there or whatnot, but he's going to want to play well because he's on a bridge contract. He's going to want to step up. I like Columbus where they're at. They may not win the division, but they'll still be there. They'll be in the thick of it. Unfortunately, Max Domi kind of takes me as a... Uh, Don't say prima donna. Matt Duchesne kind of character. Oh, great. No, he's going to be... You he's done gonna, it. He's going to be... Nope, you, you already crossed that line. A, you're already there. You're going down. He's a decent tool. Next! That can... He's going to move around a lot. Uh, moving on, yikes! <laughs> Detroit. They added Grice, Bobby Ryan, Vladislav Nemestikov, Sam Gagne, Mark Stahl, and to- and Troy Stetcher. By the way, Nemestikov, nephew of Vladdy Kozlov. His Vladdy Kozlov's picture is across the his stall in the Detroit Red Wings locker room, so he gets to look at his uncle every day. Aww. So apparently, Nemestikov was a Red Wings fan. Oh boy, maybe that's why it's like, hey, cool, Stevie Eisman drafted me. I remember when my uncle played with him. Hi, Uncle Stevie. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> I think that'd be a little awkward. <laughs> Thanks, Uncle Stevie. I mean, Mr. Eiserman. Uh, listen. Uh, do I still, do I call you captain or boss? I Captain uh, Boss Man. This team is interesting to me, Alex, because I like to think they're going to be good. They're going to be better. They're going to be better because they're going to be more competitive. They have Grice. They and- won't be competitive until they get rid of Bertuzzi. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's a tough division that they're in. I think they'll they'll win more than 15 games. Tough division. What? No, they're not. <laughs> okay, I'm looking at the top three teams I have to go up against. I think they'll get they'll do well against Chicago. Detroit, they're going to do better. Hey, we got to get Weber on the show just so we can have Detroit and Nashville games. They're going to do better. Do you think Pete Weber would be willing to do like a live call while he's calling a game against Detroit? Like, Absolutely uh, not. He don't care. We're live here on the Kula Show with Pete Weber. Pete, what's going on? And on the left wing side, here comes a shot. Ben and Philip Forsberg, and here come the Red Wings. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. 
Uh, moving on, we have Florida lost to the Islanders in the qualifying round with Bobrovsky needing to be more consistent. Patrick Hornquist uh, traded from Pittsburgh. It's a tough division for them. Can they be successful? It's a 50-50 shot for me. I think they do have. If Bob plays better, yes. If Bob does what he does last year, no. Heck no. But you have to think, though, they are used to their conditions. So, I mean, not having a crowd is is probably going to be good to their advantage. I, I like Hornquist because you add that little bit of depth and you add a little grit, a little toughness because he's a skilled player, but he can play around the net tough. I think they need that. And, you know, who knows? With that? I know they lost Mike Hoffman because Mike Hoffman's apparently staying with St. Louis, which we'll get to in a minute. But uh, you still ha- they still have Barkov. You still have, you know, you have talent there. I just don't know if they're a playoff team anymore. Right. I don't think they're my dark horse this year, Alex, unfortunately. Moving on, we have Minnesota. No more Dubnik or Stahl. Cam Talbot being the new starting goaltender for them with Capo Kakinen. Yep, you, said that, you said that right. Capo Kakinen. Uh, to back him up with Stalock Hurt, thank, question mark. Th- thank you, Micheletti, for that one. Uh, Marco Rossi out and definitely with an upper body injury. That was a guy that people were looking forward to because, you know, he while Osher was not a great team, he still was competitive in the World Juniors by you know, being their best player and... It's tough to see uh, is, Team Austria out with an injury. Minnesota, uh, I don't know this year, Alex. Minnesota, grab a soda and just sit back. Just chill. I, I want this team. Like, listen. Don't finish, expect anything. Finish be, fourth, lose in the first round, and call it good. Just like the do every year. Just be happy when you win games. That's all, that's all they'll, you they'll do. do. They'll do okay. They're not going to do great, though. Uh, Nashville's the next team. They're not much better than last season, which, I mean, that's not really good at all. Um, they picked up Matt or Wecky? <laughs> Matt Borietsky. Sure. Mark Borietsky. Uh, <laughs> Matt Borietsky. <laughs> Same guy who I've on the show for this one. Uh, Luke Coonan. Uh, Cuman. I'm going to call him Cuman. Okay. Luke Cuman, two by 2.3 million. Uh, it's a question of whether or not John Hines' systems is going to be met with open arms. I think they'll be a team. <laughs> They're going to be a team. Fair enough. Next and final team is Tampa. Uh, they won... The Stanley Cup last year, they got rid of Cedric Paquette and Braden Coburn, to gained uh, goaltender Anders Nielsen. Um, can they do it again? No. No, absolutely not. Why? Because in the playoffs, Steven Stamkos is going to play, and he is not that good. Except he scored a goal, and he's like his only shift in the playoffs, or second, like his third shift. Anyway, so... Ah, yes. When John Travolta stabs me in the chest with an adrenaline needle, I'd be doing well, too. Or, okay, I'm glad you went Pulp Fiction there, not Wolf of Wall Street. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. What, I'm not, what, I'm not Leo DiCaprio just smashing a microphone up to his head? Yeah! <laughs> I can't say the whole thing. All right, go. Sma- picks. Launching. Picks. No. Uh, my picks for this division has to be in no particular order. Uh, Carolina, it's going to be Columbus. I'm going to put in uh, Minnesota and Tampa. Because I don't think that anybody else is going to do really that well. Okay. So, so okay. what you say? Car- Actually, well, not. Sc- screw it. No, screw it. Carolina, Columbus, Detroit, and Tampa. What? Throw Detroit in there. Why what? not? What Who the cares? heck is this? Detroit. Count really? it. Really? Money. My goodness. Count it. Oh, good lord. Okay. Why not? Okay. They My, could do it. Tampa will win the division just because Tampa will do the regular season thing like they tend to do. I'm going to go with Carolina number two. Number three will be. Columbus, and four will be Minnesota because they'll do the thing. And then I'm going to round it out They're with gonna do the thing? Florida, Nashville, Detroit, Chicago. I'll say Chicago finishes last. I'll give Detroit. I'll give them not last. Fair enough. Uh, we move to West, brought to you by Honda. Not Hyundai. No, Honda. Anaheim, the first team. The first team on the A's because they're alphabetical order. Just run through it, Alex. <laughs> uh, finished sixth in the Pacific. John Gibson's going to be need. To, he's going to need to be good again. Uh, only reason, uh, only real addition, excuse me, is Kevin Shattenkirk. They're not going to be good. At least they have a nice jersey, though. Yes, they do. Arizona. They got smoked by Colorado in round one this year. No more Taylor Hall, but Barrett Hayton's going to yeah. join the team. Missed last year after injury in the World Juniors. Can Darcy Kemper do it again? I hope so. They Maybe. need him. Are they going to dismantle the team? I don't know. Phil Kessel. I mean, it's a money issue with all that. That's why they couldn't keep Taylor Hall. Arizona is in trouble. Dismantle what? Uh, Colorado lost in the second round to Dallas. The team is still good, um, but they are ready to make it. Are they ready to make it over the hump is the question. Yeah. Uh, no Nikita Zadorov, but they did receive Devin Taves instead. 
This is a big thing for them. I think they, for them, it's a 60-40. They have a 60% chance of making the playoffs. Actually, no, 70% chance of making the playoffs and a 50-50 on whether or not they're going to make it past the first round. Yes. Count it. Dallas, lost in the finals last year. No, he'd open to start the year. Immigration issues, similar to the two, Casper A. Kapanen. It means we have to rely on Ben Bishop, which means you are in trouble. I'm sorry. Uh, Joe Pavelski, I don't know the update on him, was last season a fluke. I'm not sure. They'll have to start on the 19th because of COVID-19. That's hilarious, Alex. Uh -huh. But Dallas, yeah, they're, I don't know if they'll have the same. I mean, they may. They, who knows? But anyways. Los Angeles is the next team to talk about. Finished seventh in the Pacific. Still old, still suck. But hey, at least they got Quentin Byfield, right? And what's that name? Arthur Kaliev? Kaliev, yeah. Kaliev, yeah. From Hamilton, Hamilton Bulldogs. That's a name that you don't really hear often. Arthur. Arthur. I like it. Art. Art. St. Louis. Archie's got to party. The team that has been complaining the most about being in the Western Conference or Western Wait. Division, even though they're literally they're a shoe and playoff team now, even though they lost Alex Petrolangelo, Ryan O'Reilly, the new sheriff in town, the new captain. I mean, Tarasenko, what's his health status at? Can he come back at 100%? Is his, where's his head at? Because he, for him, I mean, the biggest thing was, you know, he people were saying that he was mad that he wasn't named captain. Can Bennington rebound? They need him to. I mean, let's hope the Blues have a better year. And San Jose is the next team. Uh, they don't have Jumbo Joe. They finished last in the Pacific, which is shocking. <laughs> uh, and Devin Dubnik is their backup now, even though he's their second best player on the team. Vegas lost in the conference finals last year. You still have Flower and Leonard in net, probably the best tandem in the league. Will age catch up, though, is the question. You got Petrangelo, but you got Stone, and you got a bunch of other old guys. You got, I mean, the, the age is catching up with them. Oh, we got a lot of time to make this prediction. We ran no, we don't. We got, we got like six minutes. It's a sprint. <laughs> it's a sprint. You don't let up just because you're 50 miles ahead. No. <laughs> Finish the game. Okay, tortoise in the hair. The tortoise is not coming up anytime soon, okay? It is still back. It's, it's still over there. It's still gone. <laughs> it's all over there. Tyler, your predictions. Oh, man. I'm gonna, you know what? Colorado first. Vegas second. I am, and I'm thinking, it's, I, listen. Uh, I want to say Dallas four, but I just, if Arizona can do that thing they did last year, St. Louis will be third. St. Louis is in third. No problem there. But my biggest thing is, if Dallas is gold, if Hudobin doesn't come back at 100% and not at the same level he was last year, Dallas is done for. They don't make the playoffs. But the, especially with the ex lack of extension in the playoffs this year, which I thought maybe they would have done like another wild card round or a qualifying round. They're not going to do it this year. So I'll go Dallas four, Arizona five, which leads the California teams. I think Anaheim will do the best in the California teams. I'll go, I'll, you know what? I'll go. So yeah, I got Colorado, Vegas, St. Louis, Dallas, Arizona, unfortunately. Louis Arizona. Pinona. I, 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 mean, I want them to do well. Dip, I want just, them to do well. Just. Anaheim, L.A., San Jose. The California teams, Alex, they suck. Yep. And, that, and I say that in the best and most humane way possible. I love having John Hoven on the show a while back. I love talking. Uh, we had Eric Johnsgar, who wrote, writes for San Jose. I, don't I just don't do well in California. Well, I don't one do well. I don't do well when you pay eleven and a half million dollars for a defenseman with one actual foot. <laughs> I'm sorry. If that's your go-to, did I purchase something on PlayStation? I paid for something. Oh boy. Uh, maybe your subscription. Uh, probably my PlayStation Plus. I'm like, I'm paying for stuff automatically. Uh, who knows? But I. It's okay. Every single year, it scares me too. I'm not gonna pay or. I'm, I'm not gonna. We're not gonna do any picks for the, for playoff or for playoff prediction because we're gonna see who actually gets there. Because Can I pick? No, no, because we just picked the. Oh, you got to pick the West. Yeah, <laughs> I thought they'd be. Gosh, wow! I see how it is. No, my pick for the wow, West. Wow, wow! This has. To, wow, absolutely spectacular, phenomenal. You see, no. Here's the thing. You say it. Owen Wilson, but I hear Ted Burba. Rest in peace, Mr. Rest Burba. Peace, Ted Rest Burba. Burba. And that was a moment of sound for Ted Burbo. Okay. Former psych teacher. Good. Honestly, the Western Division, or, yeah, D Division? Division. Okay, Western Division has to be, this is the, has to be the easiest one for me to pick because it's in no particular order. Colorado, Dallas, St. Louis, and Vegas. Yeah. There are clear winners and clear losers. I think in the other three divisions, there is enough competition to have the last two spots be in contention. Even with, like, you know, like 
the East when you have like teams like Minnesota and Nashville. Nashville could just somehow do something. UC you never Saros know. could be a Vesna goaltender all of a sudden. But I don't think that's entirely possible. Right. But the West is just weak. It's just it's not a very deep conference. You got your you have your four teams and then you have your losers. Sorry. It's just like the Pacific in any other year. You have your you have your your Edmontons, you have your Vancouver's, you have a Arizona heck, and then you have in Vegas and literally everyone else down the landslide. It's an awful it's an awful division. It's and like I said, you may have Vegas make it to the finals, but in terms of division depth in general, that's why I think the North Division is the tightest. It's the hardest to pick because Winnipeg, like Ken Weeb said, we talked to him earlier, he said it could go anywhere from two to six with the Jets. Edmonton, I picked them to finish last because I don't see them. I, I just think Ottawa's going to do well. And I think Montreal, with their tandem and their depth, is going to do well. And Toronto is just going to somehow figure it out in the regular season, but they may bottom out in the playoffs, but that's for the playoffs we figured out. There is a lot to go for in the North. That's why I'm, I'm just making. excited about Ottawa. What? Oh, God. New, new, new sweaters. Well, no, new right. logo. New sweaters. And Tim. New players. Stoops oh, my God. Matt Murray. And actually, I mean, he's not, gonna, he's not the same Matt Murray like I kept saying before, but they'll be good. Alex, I think it's time to send her home. On that note, we have Talking Miners with the Rando on after us here on 12 Ounce Sports. Using hashtag on Twitter and Facebook to get involved in the conversation. Please talk to us. We're lonely. It's cold. It's not that cold. It's winter. We literally turn the heat on here for you, so shush. Thank you. For Tyler, I'm your host, Alex. We will see you next time. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. You ready for Wednesday? Wednesday's going to be exciting. Wednesday? Wednesday's when the plan. That's when the season starts. Oh, I don't care about Wednesday. What about Thursday? Uh, maybe. Okay. We'll see. Bye, everybody. Goodbye.